तुम्हारे कार्बन Namaskaram everyone and welcome to today's IIP Twin Cities branch symposium. In the month of December, it gives us a lot of pleasure to have uh, successfully conducted symposium through the year. And today's symposium on pediatric hematology is probably the last during this year. At the outset, let me thank all of you for your wonderful support for all IIP Twin Cities branch activities as well as the recently conducted IAP patch TCP Pedicon 2022. We had an amazing response for the sports day, for the cultural events, paper and poster presentations, as well as the main conference. And we thank on behalf of the organizing team, as well as the executive board of both PATS and IAP Twin Cities branch for all the delegates for your incredible support for the conference. Today's uh, symposium topics uh, topic is on pediatric hematology and we have experts from across the country sharing their expertise with us. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Sunkoj Bhaskar, sir, for his presidential remarks and to take over. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sikhishna. Distinguished uh, faculty members and the participants, wish you all a very good morning and namaskars. As you all know, this is our uh, last symposium of uh, this year, 2022 probably under the executive body of IAPTCB headed by me. Intentionally, this uh, symposium was planned for the month of December for two reasons. One is the hematology is close to the hearts of all the practicing pediatricians. In day-to-day -day practice, we see at least 20% of the cases, or maybe more than that, either as a an associated uh, symptom or with the main symptom. So we thought it should be given a status of like a chief guest participating in any meeting, they will be speaking at last. So the Pediatric Hematology Conference, the Hematology Symposium, is a, it's like a chief guest for all the symposia which we had done earlier. And the second reason was in the month of January, uh, we had this uh, National uh, Hematology Conference which was a hybrid event. So I thought we wanted to give some, some gap for the, that conference and this symposium. And uh, once again, I'm very proud to say, we, the uh, office bearers of uh, IAP Twin Cities branch, without failing, we had done 12, with this 12 symposia on different subspecialities. And as well, we had done 11 IAP TCB monthly virtual clinical meetings wherein we present four interesting cases. Not only this, we have the another third uh, monthly event that is IAP Twin Cities branch, virtual PG clinics, mainly meant for uh, residents, PG students, and to the practicing pediatricians. Therein we take one case, it will be discussed like we present during our final year. Not only this, we did, we did so many central IAP week celebrations, central IAP workshops, and we had done two major conferences. One was uh, Central June conference in the month of July. And the one recently, last Sunday, was the last day of the IAP TCB and PATS annual conference. 
So with these few remarks, uh, my dear distinguished faculty members, I sincerely thank you all for taking out your precious time on Sunday morning and uh, participating in this symposia. It shows two things, uh, your acceptance to our request. Secondly, uh, your, your passion to spread your knowledge and skills to the learners, to the participants, and to the upcoming pediatricians. My special thanks to Dr. Sirisha Rani, who is the script writer for this program, and as well the director of the program. She's everything. I just requested her to organize the symposia. She had chosen the faculty. She had chosen the topics. And we all have 100% confidence in her. And then we kept silent. We were silent. And the program which she made was far better than what we thought in our minds. So my sincere thanks to Dr. Viva, Dr. Kalra, Dr. Virendra Patil, Dr. Uh, uh, Pariniti, Dr. Siddharth, Dr. Richa Jain, Dr. Varshini, and uh, all the other participants. Unfortunately, we are missing Dr. Emine from Ames B.B. Nagar. I have special association with Viva. I'm tempted to say that because my granddaughter's name is Viva. Uh, this was, this was uh, fixed by my daughter-in-law. My name is Bhaskar. My wife's name is Vijaya. So V-I is Vijaya and B-H is myself. So I was happy to listen to your uh, great personality like Dr. Viva Bafna. So we seek all your... Sir, Viva also best. means morning. So it's associated with sun. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you one and all. And I uh, hand over this... Uh, program to Dr. Sirisha Rani, who will be conducting this session. Thank you all once again. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your confidence and uh, kind introduction in us and then kind introduction. Uh, I uh, really appreciate all the faculty and participants for their enthusiasm on Sunday morning to participate first thing in the morning in this webinar. As Sir said, hematology is always close to heart for many pediatricians. And in that, like anemia is definitely a, a common, being a common problem, we all get excited to investigate the cause, to treat the child and to do the needful for the patients who come to us. So to address that, like, you know, we have designed like different topics in hematology, um, uh, microcytic, hypochromic, macrocytic and autoimmune, which is a tough one to treat and microcytic, a common one, macrocytic, which is another interesting one. And other than that, we also have a, a topic on how to uh, uh, treat as well as to prevent because we know that, you know, uh, prevention definitely uh, matters in these problems. And other than that, uh, we have an interesting panel discussion at the end on thalassemia. So, so uh, the thalassemia major, of course, a uh, couple of topics we could not cover, but the common ones and the interesting ones we are going to cover today. Uh, so with this introduction, I will quickly move on to the topic. Uh, I will introduce the first speaker, Dr. Richa Jain. She is consultant in uh, pediatric hematology oncology in PGA Mar Chandigarh, who is a dear junior to us in PGA. Uh, over to Dr. Richa. So she is uh, going to enlighten us on microcytic hypochromic anemia. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you to the organizers for the kind introductions. Uh, without further ado, I'll start sharing my screen. And I will be talking about microcytic hypochromic anemia, as Dr. Sharisha mentioned. I hope my screen is visible and I am audible uh, to all. Yes. Thank you. So uh, when we talk about microcytic hypochromic anemia, as has been mentioned, it's one of the commonest OPD problems that we see, it's typically an add-on problem. Children walk in for some other reason and are diagnosed with an associated anemia. They come in with URIs, they come in with fevers or diarrhea. So when we spot this anemia, what are we supposed to do about it? First of all, let me come to the definitions of anemia. Uh, the WHO gives uh, definitions of anemia by age. The numbers we are supposed to remember are here, 11, 11.5 and 12, children less than five years with a HP of less than 11 are anemic. Children between five to 11 years with a HP of 11.5 are anemic. And children above 11 years with a HP less than 12 are considered to be anemic. Uh, please note here that there have been recent large population-based studies, uh, which have been published in Lancet also, which uh, 
from India, which document that Indian population probably has a slightly lower cutoff by about 1 to 1.5 gram of hemoglobin. And this uh, definition of WHO definition of anemia may not be fit for our population. However, this is conjectural at this point of time, and this has not been adopted into any guidelines. This is still open for discussion. By these definitions of WHO, we have a very high pop, uh, percentage prevalence of anemia in under five population. Uh, 67, two third of the children under five in India are anemic. This number has gone up by about 8% from the uh, last NFHS survey. So we are looking at a huge uh, population with anemia. What exactly is microcytic hypochromic anemia? Uh, children who have a low MCV, low MCH, RBCs which are small in size and have lower absolute hemoglobin content in the RBC are labeled as microcytic hypochromic anemia. While there are uh, age and ethnicity related norms for MCV and MCH, uh, grossly it's reasonable to presume that children with a MCV of less than 78 femtoliter are microcytic children with a MCV of less than 26, MCH of less than 26 picogram have hypochromia. So uh, if we remember these numbers, it's sufficient for all purposes. What are the causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia? By far the commonest cause is iron deficiency, which is primarily nutritional. There are some very rare genetic causes of iron deficiency anemia, which I will be touching upon in this talk. However, by and large, a majority of the patients have nutritional iron deficiency when they have microcytic hypochromic anemia. The other major cause is thalassemia, which again will be discussed in detail in this symposium. And this is primarily beta thalassemia, trait intermediate and major, but alpha thalassemia is also quite prevalent. The rarer causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia are sideroblastic anemia. Anemia of chronic disease may be normocytic, it may be microcytic. Lead poisoning, copper deficiency, rare unstable hemoglobinopathies kind of complete the list. If we look at this, uh, chart, this geographical distribution, this talks about the prevalence of iron deficiency, excuse me, uh, based on the, uh, this is like uh, iron deficiency in under five children world over WHO data. And as you can see, we are in the severe zone, which is more than 40%. And if we look at the thalassemia distribution for both alpha as well as beta thalassemias, we are right bang, the entire country is right bang in the middle of the thalassemia belt as well. So we have our huge share of microcytic hypochromic anemia. So I'll now come to some frequently asked questions for microcytic hypochromic anemia. When we are sitting in OPD, what are we exactly supposed to do when we see a child with anemia? So my first question to myself is what should I ask in the OPD to narrow down my differentials? So I'll answer this by saying that we should take a detailed history. Uh, a lot of times we do not take a detailed dietary history, but a uh, dietary history would definitely help figure out how likely iron deficiency anemia is in the index case, as well as presence of other nutritional anemias. And presence of pica, which is often forgotten, is a strong indicator towards iron deficiency anemia. In the diet, the pertinent points are how much milk is a child taking, whether there is bottle feeding or not, uh, whether if a child is taking milk more than 500 to 600 ml in a day at the age of more than one year, then definitely this is excessive milk intake, whether complementary feeding has been started on time or not, and what kind of a diet, is it only rice and chapati, and is it primarily vegetarian, which again would lead towards iron deficiency. Worm infestation is another pointer to ask. So when uh, further pertinent points on history is for microcytic hypochromic anemia, we need to ask for indicators towards chronic diseases. Uh, presence of recurrent significant infections would point towards some kind of an underlying chronic disease. Presence of repeated diarrheas would definitely point towards a GI pathology, whether it be celiac disease, it be uh, inflammatory bowel disease or something else underlying. Polyuria and salt craving point towards chronic kidney disease, which is very frequently associated with uh, severe anemias as well as microcytic anemias. Uh, if there is a history of recurrent jaundice, that makes iron deficiency a bit less likely and makes hemoglobinopathies uh, much more likely. Another key point to ask in the history is blood transfusion. If there is a history of blood transfusion, specifically more than a single blood transfusion, then plain simple iron deficiency becomes quite unlikely. Uh, 
thalassemias, chronic diseases, and sideroblastic anemias all are frequently associated with the history of blood transfusion. Rarely iron refractory IDAs, other hemoglobinopathies, and unstable hemoglobinopathies would require blood transfusion as well. Rarely because these diseases are rare, not because uh, blood transfusion is uncommon in these patients. So uh, uh, to help further differentiate here, age at first transfusion, frequency of transfusion, and pre-BT hemoglobin would help us figure out uh, what among these is more likely? As I said, plain simple IDA would very rarely require a blood transfusion and definitely more than one blood transfusion is a serious pointer against IDA. Uh, patients with irida and sideroblastic anemia as well as chronic disease may require intermittent blood transfusion, but not regular blood transfusions. Patients with thalassemia major would of course be requiring regular blood transfusion. On the clinical examination, pertinent points to note are whether the facies are entirely normal as compared to the family or not. Uh, hemolytic facies are pretty overt in children with major thalassemia, but they may be quite subtle and not be pronounced till adolescence in children who have milder variants of thalassemia intermedia, milder variants of HVH disease or alpha thalassemias. And hemolytic facies are not there at all in patients who have thalassemia minor. So it would not help us differentiate between iron deficiency and thalassemia minor. Jaundice needs to be noted. Again, features of chronic disease, short stature, rickets should be noted because they help us point towards chronic kidney disease, celiac disease, and other chronic diseases. Presence of splenomegaly effectively uh, rules out iron deficiency anemia, iron refractory iron deficiency anemia, and makes hemoglobinopathies high on the card or rarely chronic diseases with microcytic anemia high on the card. Splenomegaly may occasionally be present in sideroblastic anemia, but it's usually small at present. So coming to the frequently asked question two, what are the tests I should run in the OPD before I start uh, Iron, treating, uh, iron treatment for a child with microcytic hypochromic anemia? And how do I confirm whether my patient definitely has iron deficiency or should I start empirical therapy? So what tests should I run? So we have done a CBC with indices, the MCV, the MCH, the RDW, and the RPC count. This will help confirm whether we are indeed dealing with anemia, microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, once we have confirmed this, Often it's quite possible to uh, differentiate, delineate based on just the history and examination, whether we are uh, dealing with a deficiency anemia or thalassemia or something a bit less likely. But in case it's not super clear from the history, we can do some other basic investigations. A ferritin will help us uh, clear the presence of iron deficiency anemia. A CRP helps us clear chronic diseases. And a slightly newer marker, which is present in some of the labs uh, with advanced equipment is CHR or cellular hemoglobin of reticulocyte. This helps again define the presence of iron deficiency anemia and also helps in monitoring response to not just iron deficiency but other deficiency anemias as well. If we have done these tests, we can easily figure out things. We see here that we have a CBC, ferritin, and a CRP. If anemia is present but there is a normal CRP, with a low ferritin, then we are likely dealing with the iron deficiency anemia. However, with a normal CRP, if the ferritin is on the higher side, then iron deficiency anemia becomes quite unlikely, and we are possibly dealing with other causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia here. If anemia is present, but the CRP is also elevated, that means there is some kind of underlying inflammation, and we should evaluate further. Despite that, if the ferritin is low, then it's a very high likelihood that it's iron deficiency anemia because ferritin is also an acute phase reactant and it would go high in any kind of inflammation. If ferritin is still low, then iron deficiency becomes very, very likely at this point. Ferritin more than 150 here becomes IDA unlikely. However, uh, ferritin, which is kind of intermediate, would require further evaluation by a peripheral smear or a transfer in saturation and CHR, as I just mentioned. A ferritin less than 15 with no anemia is an iron deficiency state, which would be covered in the subsequent talks. So is there a gold standard for defining iron deficiency anemia? For practical purposes, transfer in saturation less than 10% is the gold standard for diagnosis of IDA. All the other parameters have variable sensitivity and specificity, including isolated anemia, MCV, CHR, low ferritins, elevated protoporphyrin, and 
transferrin receptor percentage. So, uh, but uh, in day-to-day -day practice, we mostly do not need to do a transferrin saturation. As I mentioned here, CBC, ferritin, and CRP are more than enough to delineate the kind of microcytic hypochromic anemia we are dealing with. So coming to FAQ3, what is the dose and duration of therapy? I will not talk too much about it because uh, it will be touched upon in a further talk. Suffice to say that oral iron ferrous sulfate is a gold standard. The dose is 3 mg per kg as a single dose with a duration of three to six months. Now, this is a question which often comes to the mind of pediatricians. You have a child with thalassemia minor with anemia. What are we supposed to do? Should you give iron? So uh, let me come to a case scenario, which I saw in the OPD. We had this three-year-old boy who came to the attention as he had recurrent URIs. Once he started going to school, his pediatrician noted that he had pallor and uh, did a CBC. Examination was non-significant. Uh, there was no organomegaly. In the CBC, there was definite anemia. HP was 8.2. The rest of the counts were on the normal side. The MCV was quite low at 61 femtoliter. MCH was quite low. RBC count was towards the lower normal side. And on the HVLC was done with the HVA2, which was elevated. Anything above 3.5 to 4, depending on the machine we use, is elevated. So this child definitely had a thalassemia trait with the uh, HV of 8.2 anemia. So now the question was, what is to be done with this child? So if we look at the CBC carefully, we are already seeing indicators that this child has associated iron deficiency. First of all, we see this platelet count, which is a bit elevated. So thrombocytosis is a feature of iron deficiency. And we see a RBC count, which is a bit on the lower side, not truly like thalassemia, which would have elevated RBC count. So we took a detailed history and we found that this child had primarily a milk and cereal based diet. He was drinking milk three to four times in a day. He had a history of pica and we were reasonably sure at this point that we are dealing with a nutritional anemia associated with thalassemia minor. If we are not very sure at this point, we can do a serum ferritin. It would help us confirm the presence of uh, iron deficiency where serum ferritin would still be low despite there being a thalassemia minor. So in this kind of a situation, it's very uh, fine to give a trial of oral iron and reassess after a couple of weeks for incremental uh, hemoglobin levels. And once we have confirmed this, we continue therapeutic iron. HP typically does not try to rise to absolute norms, but it will become more than 10 gram per deciliter in a child who has just a thalassemia minor. So coming to uh, another uh, important point is when we have, once you have seen a child like that, it's mandatory to go back, ask the parents to get a HPLC done because if a child has thalassemia trait, one parent definitely is a thalassemia trait and the other uh, parent may as well be thalassemia trait or normal. If both the parents have a thalassemia trait, they would need antenatal counseling for every pre pregnancy to prevent the birth of thalassemia major child in their family. So coming to the next question, uh, when do I decide that oral iron is not working? So iron refractoriness is defined when you have given oral uh, appropriate oral iron therapy of 3 to 6 mg per kg per day. Typically, it's 3, not 6, for an appropriate time period of at least 4 weeks. And we do not see uh, appropriate response, which is a rise of hemoglobin of more than 1 gram per deciliter in this time frame. So this is the definition of iron refractoriness and what are its causes, what further tests are required. When iron does not work in a microcytic hypochromic anemia, uh, it may happen in 10 to 15% of the cases. There are some obvious causes like thalassemia major and intermedia, which are typically clinically evident and are not confused with uh, iron deficiency anemia at this point. But we need to start thinking of uh, chronic diseases like chronic kidney disease, uh, uh, bowel involvement, less common causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia like sideroblastic and lead poisoning and iron. So when we assess the cause of iron refractoriness, we look at the compliance, we look at ongoing losses because of GI illnesses, Michaels diverticulum, bogum infestation, other losses, menstrual pulmonary and urinary, uh, inadequate absorption, which may happen due to celiac disease or H. pylori infection in a slightly older age group. Uh, Long-term PPI therapy or GI surgery would also lead to inadequate absorption, though it's uncommon in pediatrics. Incorrect diagnosis, whether we have missed a thalassemia minor, rare hemoglobinopathy, sideroblastic anemias, or chronic kidney diseases, and then come to the genetic causes of uh, iron absorption or utilization, which is IRIDA. So what tests do we do to distinguish between these causes? Uh, 
an HPLC, of course, a transfer and saturation and an extended iron profile would help at this point of time. A celiac serology, renal and liver function test, they would help us rule out chronic diseases and reasons for poor iron absorption and stool for rockwell blood to look for losses. This needs to be done at least three times. HPLC will help rule out associated beta thalassemia trait. Sometimes other unusual hemoglobinopathies would be picked up like HBC, HBD disease. HBH is often uh, evident on the HPLC when an experienced person is looking at the HPLC, though further tests may be required. And sometimes unstable hemoglobin may be picked up on a HPLC. So that would help us figure out the less common causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia. An iron profile would help us confirm presence of IDA and make chronic diseases, sideroblastic anemia, a bit evident, where uh, the serum ferritin is high in sideroblastic anemia, it's low in iron deficiency anemia, a transfer and saturation is low in IDA, but it's high in sideroblastic anemia, a serum iron is low in IDA, but it's normal to high in sideroblastic anemia, and the rest of the investigations are a bit less common, and we don't frequently do that. Still, it's possible to be confused at this point uh, whether we are dealing with something else and we are still open to alpha thalassemias or other rare hemoglobinopathies which may not be picked up on HPLC, citroblastic anemia or IRIDA or genetic iron deficiency anemia. So at this point, further investigations like mutation analysis directed towards IRIDA, citroblastic anemia or hemoglobinopathies may help depending on what kind of a clinical suspicion we have and a bone marrow examination would help us uh, confirm the diagnosis of cytoplastic anemia. So uh, coming to one more case scenario, we had this Master J who was a six-year-old boy from Punjab who presented with progressive pallor since the age of one year. There was no pertinent history. He had a normal diet, no diarrhea, no bleeds, no jaundice, but, and he had required a blood transfusion at the age of 1.5 years. So the birth history was unremarkable. He had received multiple uh, doses of oral hematinics without significant response. His HP stayed between seven to eight gram percent and his diet was normal. The examination was essentially unremarkable. There was no stunting, there was no organomegaly. So we were dealing with a non-syndromic microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, we gave a trial of oral iron here while we decided to further investigate him. His HP only rose from 7.7 .7 gram to 8.1 gram percent. His platelets were quite high, again, indicating thrombocytosis secondary to iron deficiency, and the peripheral smear confirmed that there was severe microcytic hypochromic anemia and poikilocytosis, no indicators of a chronic disease. So uh, we decided to evaluate further. Uh, we saw that stool for occult blood was negative, a technetium scan was negative, a TTGA was negative, so it was not a celiac disease, and HPLC was essentially normal. In fact, if you see here, the HPA2 was low, which again uh, may happen in iron deficiency. We did an iron study, which confirmed presence of iron deficiency. The serum ferritin was quite low, transfer and saturation was low, TIBC was elevated, and iron was uh, low. So citroblastic anemia was kind of unlikely here, where transfer and saturation and ferritin are both higher. So at this point, we proceeded for genetic evaluation for iron refractory IDA. This kind of a situation is quite uncommon to see in the day-to-day -day OPD practice. But when you come across such a case, this is where we were in this particular child. What exactly is iron refractory IDA? It is a rare inherited iron metabolism defect. Uh, TMP RSS gene on chromosome 22 is the causative gene. Here, there is a persistent microcytic hypochromic anemia with poor response to standard doses of iron. So uh, there is moderate anemia with severe microcytosis, occasional transfusion requirement, which is what was the case in this particular child. Family history may or may not be there, and there are no phenotypic abnormalities. The lab parameters are quite similar to iron deficiency anemia, but ferritin may at times be on the higher side, not as low as an iron deficiency anemia. And the treatment is typically parenteral iron or high doses of oral iron with vitamin C may be tried if we don't want to give parenteral iron. Just oral iron alone is less successful. So either we give parenteral iron or we give higher doses of oral iron of about five to six milligram per kg per day in two divided doses associated with vitamin C. And it works in a certain percentage of cases. In this index child, we did an NGS for mutation and we found that he had a compound heterozygous pathological mutation in the TMPRSS gene. And we confirmed presence of iridar, gave him parenteral iron, 
his HP was remarkable at 14 weeks and rose from 7 gram per deciliter to 14 gram per deciliter, though microcytosis was still remaining. And this is a feature of iron, uh, IRIDA, actually, that microcytosis does not resolve completely. The platelet count came back to normal. So uh, this was a case which flummoxed us. This is the last case and last few slides. We had a five-year-old child who had pallor for six months, which was sudden and onset, gradually progressive, transiently improving with hematonyx. This child received four transfusions in six months. So onset at four and a half years of age, multiple transfusions. There was, apart from pallor, there was nothing on the examination. So her HP was quite low. She had microcytosis, hypochromia, the rest of the counts were normal. The retic was elevated, but not elevated enough for this kind of a hemoglobin. The HPLC was normal. The ferritin was within norms. The DCT was negative. TGEF was negative. However, the bone marrow done at this point was remarkable for a pearl zero, which is like there was no iron store at all. So this ferritin was obviously elevated as a part of some kind of a chronic uh, or acute inflammation. The rest of the evaluation for losses, RBC scintigraphy, stool for occult blood, urine hemocytrin were all negative. So we were a bit flummoxed here and stuck. This child presented to OPD with low-grade fever and severe pallor in the second month of follow-up. We found mild cough and tachypnea, Krebs on examination. We thought she has evolving CCF, secondary to anemia. So we rushed her to the emergency where a chest x-ray was done. And we saw this, both the lung fields were white, diffuse pulmonary hemorrhage was there. So a bronchoscopy and a bowel confirmed our diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary hemocidrosis. And so rarer causes at times may also present with iron deficiency anemia is the point here. This child was further evaluated and after steroids, he is fine right now. And I'll stop right here and take questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richa, for an enlightening talk, touching uh, practical aspects like what to ask when they come to OPD. This is a very common problem, as we all know, like, you know, what to question, how to narrow down the differentials and uh, uh, how to interpret the CBP, looking at the red cell indices and uh, different, going to differentials and investigating and all. So we have one interesting question by Dr. Lakshman. Uh, uh, does liposomal iron better than standard iron salt? Any randomized control trials on that? So uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that the standard of care till date is iron sulfate, ferrous sulfate for oral iron therapy and all other drugs which are coming are compared against ferrous sulfate. Equivalence has been seen in ferrous ascorbate, ferrous fumarate salts. Uh, the colloidal, the uh, polymaltose complex, they are not as efficacious. Uh, this colloidal, uh, sorry, you mentioned lipid. What was the question? Li liposomal iron salts. Liposomal iron salts is something that we have never tried. And I am not aware whether there are uh, large scale data available in pediatric age group. But our main concern with iron ferrous salts is that we are scared of the side effects. Then... Uh, uh, it's actually not true. The side effects are minimal with the ferrous salts. And I think, again, the iron will be taken up in more detail in subsequent talks. So uh, we'll yeah. stop. So I think uh, that will be covered by Dr. Manas in the subsequent talk. Thank you very much. So any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with this, we'll move on to another interesting topic, uh, uh, lecture by Dr. Viba Bafna. Uh, on approach to macrocytic anemia. So various differential causes and then how to uh, narrow down the differential diagnosis and uh, management and all. So mainly on differentials and approach, she will speak and management aspect, Dr. Manas Kalra will touch. Over to Dr. Vibha Bafna. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Risha and your entire team for giving me this opportunity. Uh, shall I scan my screen? It has to go from the beginning. Uh, 
how do you go from the beginning you have to go back to the first slide in yeah thank you is it full screen and is it moving yes yes okay so uh, after the great talk from on hypochromic microcytic anemia we go on to we switch gears go on to macrocytic anemia so uh, macrocytosis is basically a strictly morphologic terms which means that rbc size is bigger than the normal range so it can be documented as a mean corpuscular volume from automated hematology instruments which we get uh, every day on our uh, cbc reports uh, it is objectively confirmed by our pathologist when he or she finds that the rbcs are uh, larger than the uh, routine rbcs rdw is basically red cell distribution width and it is a objective measure of variation in rbc sizes as estimated by our counters we will soon see its importance okay so this is a beautiful uh, normal peripheral smear where you can see that the rbcs are more or less uh, monomorphic in size and shapes and the uh, the central pallor which is 1/3 and compared to this this is a smear which is showing macrocytosis the arrows are pointing towards larger rbcs which is uh, not just larger in size they are abnormal in shapes also so there is this anisopoikilocytosis okay before we really jump on to the topic let me touch on this that the uh, uh, the rbc indices vary according to the age so we all need to be aware as pediatricians that the values given on the right hand side of your uh cbc reports may not be holding true for your patients who is a pediatric patients so for example if you take the mcv it is in the range of 95 to 121 with the mean being 108 at birth it gradually goes down reaches a nadir at of about 77 and in infancy at 6 months to 2 years and then gradually again climbs up to the adult values of uh 88 to 90 so uh having said that what is a quick way to compute so in your day to day practice if you remember that beyond neonatal period mcv is low if it is less than 70 and above 95 is abnormal the way to calculate is it's you add 0.6 femtoliter per year to 84 till you reach 96 so then that is your definition of macrocytosis so mcv uh, coming to this indice in your uh, cbc report so if you have a child with anemia his hemoglobin is low the next thing you do is you look at your mcv it is a very good initial clue to look for the etiology of anemia so uh, you can have a microcytic anemia if the mcv is less than 70 a macrocytic as i said if it is more than 90 95 and normocytic in between and this is how it goes so you can divide the causes there so this is a etiology classification of anemia according to the rbc size if you have a macrocytic anemia you can divide it into a megaloblastic megaloblastic is a picture which is seen on the bone marrow examination and you can have a non megaloblastic anemias uh we can also uh, still going back to your cbc report if you have a high mcv then next thing to look at is the rdw if your rdw is normal that means it is a macrocytic homogeneous and the cause here can be aplastic anemias you can quickly look at your other cell lines if your wbc cell line is low the platelet is also low then there is a sinister uh, problem sitting out there it can be aplastic anemia which can be acquired or it can also be inherited aplastic anemias like fanconi's uh, dyskeratosis etc there can be miscellaneous causes of macrocytic anemias hypothyroidism liver disease and many more if your mcv is high and rdw is also high that means it is a macrocytic heterogeneous uh, anemia and the most common causes are the b12 folate deficiencies which are mostly nutritional but you can have rarer congenital inborn errors of metabolism the special case here is a immune hemolytic anemia wherein it is a spuriously high mcv you can have aggregates of rbcs which are counted by your counter as a single rbcs and that brings the entire the entire average of mcv up so you have to be aware of that then what are the causes of macrocytosis as as i've already said uh one thing we need to remember is reticulocytosis so what is a reticulocyte it is the immediate precursor of your uh, uh mature rbcs and it can be very high in acute hemolytic anemias or it can be high in a recovering bone marrow after a transplant 
or uh, after chemotherapy. It can be high up to the bleeding episode. So if you have a high retic count, your average MCV will go up and that can be a, a cause of a macrocytosis. As we've said, megaloblastic anemias form a major group of macrocytic anemias and they can be uh, B12 folate deficiencies or in born errors of metabolism, something like a uh, Thymine responsive uh, megaloblastic anemias, some drugs can cause uh, errors in DNA synthesis. Then there is a huge group of miscellaneous causes. There are many, many causes out there, uh, apart from aplastic anemias and in, inborn errors of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, inborn bone marrow failure syndromes. You can have hypothyroidism, liver disease, MDS, HIV, Down syndrome. Children, babies with Down syndrome have a microcytosis. And uh, megaloblastic anemia is a subset of macrocytic anemias. And the common cause, as I said, is uh, apart from B12 and folate deficiency, congenital disorders of DNA synthesis and acquired disorders of DNA synthesis it can be drug induced. So uh, some of the anti-epileptic drugs, anti-TB uh, 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 drugs can cause uh, macrocytic anemias. So this is a beautiful picture of a, a bone marrow uh, uh, smear showing a megaloblastic picture where you can see that the RBC precursors are huge in size and the uh, cytoplasm is more mature than the uh, nucleus. So this is a nuclear cytoplasmic asynchrony, which is a very characteristic of megaloblastic anemias. The nucleus is still very open and very heterogeneous. All right. So uh, as I've already said, megaloblastic anemia is a subset of macrocytic anemia, and it is the characteristic classical picture on bone marrow. Though nowadays, with the availability, easy availability of B12 and folate levels, we rarely do bone marrows to diagnose that. Now, having done uh, this little part of introduction and theory, let's see how we interpret this on the cases. So here is a four month old female baby. She was brought for a gastroenteritis, but she was noticed to uh, be very pale, lethargic. She was failing to thrive. On taking a history, she was exclusively breastfed and mother was almost a vegan, not just a vegetarian. She had a uh, knuckle hyperpigmentation and she did not have any hepatosplenomegaly. So this was a picture of this baby. You can see very sparse, depigmented hair, lethargic. And if you carefully see, she had a this kind of a knuckle pigmentation on her hemogram. She was uh, severely anemic with a high MCV. Uh, it's of 90, which if you remember, it's high for her age. The RDW was very wide at 21. The other cell lines, the total WBC though looks normal at 6,200. But if you do the ANC, absolute neutrophil count, it's only 620, which is less than 1,500. So it is low. The platelet was also on the lower side. So uh, a pancytopenia with high MCV and with a high RDW. The peripheral smear was uh, very classical, macrocytic, large uh, RBCs with uh, uh, different sizes, different shapes. You can see small RBCs as well. You can see teardrops over here. And if you notice that the single neutrophil shown here has uh, uh, hypersegmented, there is a very low platelet count. You cannot see a single platelet on this smear. So this was very classical of a B12 deficiency anemia. You confirm it, did an LDH, which was high. The B12 level was very low. Uh, mother's B12 was also low. You, the child responded very well to injectable B12. The retic count jumped up to 25 and the mother also needed treatment. So this is a very classical scenario of a nutritional B12 deficiency anemia in an infant who is exclusively breastfed. So coming, to, uh, coming on to B12 absorption and metabolism, quickly if we go through the B12 that we ingest, uh, the B12 that we uh, uh, the ingest from our diet is uh, going, goes to the stomach. It binds to the transcobalamin 1 in the stomach. Then later it binds to intrinsic factor after being proteolized by the pancreatic enzyme. The B12 intrinsic factor thing comes uh, all the way to your ileum. To the uh, from your ileal cells, this uh, complex is recognized and absorbed into the portal circulation into the blood, where the B12 now binds to the transcobalamin 2. This transcobalamin 2 and the B12 complex is now identified by the receptors on the cells, and then this is taken up into the cell further to be uh, incorporated into all your epoenzymes, which are required for the metabolism. 
and especially for the production of proteins uh, for your uh, nucleic acids. So this is very important even for us clinicians to know because in that case, you will understand the disorders of B12 absorption metabolism. So having done that, the causes of B12 deficiencies can be divided into nutritional absorption defects and genetic and inborn errors of metabolism. Nutrition is when your diet is poor in B12. It not only happens in infants, but nowadays we are seeing many adolescents with food fatisms come with B12 deficiency, purely nutritional B12 deficiencies. Then you have your absorption defects. Pernicious anemia is a very uh, uh, interesting case scenarios where you have antibodies against your intrinsic factor and even antiparietal cell antibodies. Pernicious anemia can be a part of an, uh, uh, the multiple antibodies kind of scenarios. Then you can have in, uh, a genetic disorder known as uh, immersland Rasbeck syndrome, where your uh, ileal cells, uh, the ileal uh, cells lack the cubum receptor. So the, your intrinsic factor and B12 uh, uh, complex cannot be absorbed. Then you can have all sort of gastrointestinal disorders, inflammatory disorders, the, the, the uh, resections, all that which cause to poor absorption. You can have insufficient pancreatic secretions as your Zollinger Ellison syndromes. You can have infestations by D latent bacterial overgrowth, which compete for B12 and thus lead to B12 deficiencies. Then you have your rare, thankfully rare, but uh, genetic and inborn error group of B12 metabolism, uh, wherein thymine responsive megaloblastic anemia is one of the cause. You can have transcobalamin 2 deficiency. Uh, which leads to a very severe B12 deficiency anemia starting right in infancy. And then you have your um, uh, IEMs right from CB1A to CB1G disorders, which is lack of all the enzymes like uh, adenosyl, adenosyl cobalamin enzyme, your methylmalonic enzymes, which lead to severe B12 deficiencies. Uh, So uh, similarly, on the similar lines, you have causes of folate deficiencies, nutritional can be in, uh, inadequate intake of folate is very rare. It can happen in children who are undergoing transplants or chemotherapy where they have to eat only boiled food. So over boiling of your food and vegetables leads to folate deficiencies. In some of the villages in rural India, there is prolonged feeding with goat's milk. Goat's milk is very poor in folate and that can lead to nutritional folate deficiencies. In our field, in the pediatric hematology field, where you have severe hemolytic anemias, that can lead to a folate deficiency. The chronic hemolysis can lead to folate deficiencies. Then coming on to absorption defects, all your gastrointestinal disorders of chronic inflammation like sprues, regional enteritis, infil infiltrative disorders can lead to absorption defects. And then similarly, genetic and inborn error of metabolisms of folate, as in uh, MTHFR deficiencies can lead to uh, folate disorders, which are extremely rare. Then coming on to another case over here, this was a nine and a half year old male who was brought with history of developing reddish spots, particularly all over the body, easy bruising noticed by the mother and intermittent bleeding gums and urina. On examination, he was a well child, but he was pale. He had few petechiae. He had no lymphadenopathy or organomegaly, no bony tenderness. On his CBC, he was moderately anemic. His MCV was high, 96 for his age. His RDW here was bad, normal. And retic count was way uh, low for his anemia. His WBC count, again, if you see the ANC is very low. So a low WBC count, low platelets. So this is again a pancytopenia here with raised ICV, but uh, MCV, but with normal RD, RDW. His peripheral smear was normocytic, few macrocytes. There was neutropenia, low platelets. So the bone marrow aspiration was ordered over here and he had a hypocellular marrow with increase in fat cells, very low megakaryocytes. So this is a pancytopenia, a plastic anemia, pancytopenia. But again, having a close look at his boy. So if you see, look at this boy, he was short in stature. If you look carefully at his face, he had this triangular faces and look at the perioral hyperpigmentation. So this is a child and then look at his hands. What is there? So he has this thumb abnormalities on both the sides. So any guesses, this is, this was the next test that was ordered, which is a chromosomal breakage test. 
when the uh, WBCs are treated with mitomycin C, and you see this classical picture of chromosomal breaking, triradial formation, the breakage pointed by the pink arrows, the triradial by the green uh, circle. So this is a case of Fanconi's anemia, which is the commonest inborn, uh, uh, inborn bone marrow failure syndromes, causing a pancytopenia, typically manifesting at um, 8 to 10, 10 years of age. And not only these children are prone for aplastic anemia, but they are also prone for many cancers later in the life. Uh, then similarly going on to a next case, this was a six month old male infant who was born of a non-consanguineous marriage and uh, was incidentally found very pale on a routine vaccination visit by the pediatrician. Uh, she said there was no hepatosplenomegaly, there were no dysmorphic faces. She was referred to our center. Uh, on, his, on the CBC of this child, she was severely anemic. The RBC count was very low. The MCV was high, 107, even for six months of age. The RDW was normal. And the other series over here, if you see the total WBC count was very normal. The platelet count was also normal at 5.45 lakhs. The B12, though not suspected, not uh, clinically possible, but was done nevertheless, it was normal. The, the uh, HPLC done over here was very interesting. The A2 was normal, the HBF was 50. So there was rise in HBF. Again, a bone marrow was done and it was reported as a marked paucity of all the erythroid precursors. All the other cell light was normal. All right. So this year we suspected the diagnosis to be an in, inborn error of uh, uh, inborn bone marrow failure syndrome affecting only the red blood cell series. And this is a child with diamond black fell syndrome. So nowadays you don't stop there. You do the genetic di diagnosis. And he was found to have a defect in the RPS 29 gene. So he was a diamond black fell anemia 13. All right, so I will stop over here and go through the main messages. So remember, your hemogram has a lot of keys for classifying anemia. MCV is the most important key. It is a parameter which is measured by your counters. So you can classify your anemia. Macrocytosis, remember, is a morphologic feature on a peripheral smear, whereas megaloblastosis is a feature on a bone marrow smear. Macrocytic anemia can be either megaloblastic or a non-megaloblastic, which is indicated on your CBC report as high or normal RDW. Okay. Megaloblastic anemias can be usually due to B12 and folate deficiencies. Though inborn errors of B12 and folate deficiencies exist, they are very rare and they are very severe, should be recognized. Non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemias are mostly aplastic anemias, which can be either acquired or they can be inborn uh, uh, inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. They can be also due to hypothyroidism, MDS, and there are many other causes which are clinically very uh, 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 diagnosable. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber Vib Bakhtun, for the enlightening talk on macrocytic anemia approach, how to choose the appropriate investigations and how to interpret those investigations and uh, good cl clinical scenarios and all. Uh, so we have one question uh, from Dr. Bas uh, Dr. Lakshman uh, about like, you know, adding, do we need to add B12 to all vegan pregnant women along with uh, iron folic acid supplementation? Um, actually, this is, there is no guideline as adding B12 supplementation. Yes, folic acid, everybody knows that it prevents neural tube defects. And uh, it has been found that women, and especially pregnant women, are really lacking in folate, uh, folate. So there is a guideline about folic acid, but B12, there is no guideline. So, yeah, if we yeah. are suspecting, so very then true. we should do so the level. We know that, you know, there are no guidelines, but uh, the... Uh, if you look at a question, it says like vegan <laughs> pregnant women. So, vegans, so if they are like, strictly vegan, then strictly I think vegans, we can yes, add. We do yeah. have to, yeah. yeah, yeah. But we can do a level nowadays. Levels, that is easily absolutely. Available. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we can do the levels, and we can also. And actually, the nutrition deficiency takes a long time in manifesting. It really takes a long time in manifesting. So you can do a level and then add. Very simple to add. Nowadays, oral preparations are also available. I'm sure Manas is going to talk about yes more yeah. in detail. 
thank you so we'll move on to uh, important management aspect on anemias uh, the interesting and common anemias like microcytic and macrocytic anemias to enlighten us on this uh, we have uh, dr manas kalra who is a senior consultant in pediatric hematology oncology and uh, bmt in sir gangaram hospital uh, over to you dr manas Uh, thank you, Shirisha. Am I audible and are my slides visible? Yes. Okay. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you, IAP Twin Cities. Thank you, Shirisha, for having me here on this Sunday morning uh, to talk about management and prevention of nutritional anemia. So at the onset, disclaimer, uh, I think all of you know more about iron deficiency, B12 deficiency and folic acid deficiency than any pediatric hematologist because I think you see this much more than what a pediatric hematologist oncologist would see in his practice. And uh, you people manage it on a day-to-day -day basis. And we get looped in mainly in cases where the response is inadequate or where the patient has uh, you know, uh, not done as per your expectations uh, for the management of either the microcytic or macrocytic anemia. My job has been made easy by Richa and Vibha, who have very beautifully elaborated upon the various causes of uh, microcytic and macrocytic anemias. And I'll be touching very briefly on them whilst I talk about managing a nutritional anemia in children. So I bring greetings from Gangaram Hospital, which is located in the heart of uh, Delhi. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is just very sad to look at the figures of uh, iron deficiency anemia, nutritional anemias in our country. And despite all the efforts, the CNNS survey and the NFHS 5 survey have shown that the incidence of nutritional anemia is still on the rise. So, you know, very high figures. You can see this survey was in 2016, 2018, showing almost 60 to 70% chances of anemia. While comparing NFHS 4 and 5, in fact, the, the, the indicators of anemia were worse in NFHS 5. Again, a very sad thing. And all these red bars indicate all the states where there is an increase in anemia in these target population and Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, everything features into an increasing prevalence of anemia. And so is Delhi. So we all need to do a lot of hard work. Adolescent girls, similar figures. So all the red bars indicating a, an increase in the prevalence of anemia. Only a few states have, uh, you know, decrease in prevalence of nutritional anemias. And this is despite so many national programs on management of anemia that we have not been able to get hold of that. And in fact, in our latest FOCON, which is the annual conference uh, that was organized in Delhi, uh, you know, all the senior people who came, uh, including Dr. Vinod Paul, the emphasis was on how do we make India anemia mukt, and you know, we all need a lot of work to do for this. So as Richa elaborated, we have the WHO classification to kind of say what uh, the definition of anemia is, but it may be a little bit higher uh, thresholds for India. But I think at the moment we need to stick with the WHO till we have our own kind of setup uh, to say what uh, ideal hemoglobin for an Indian patient should be. But I think we should stick to WHO at the moment and try to aim high. Bedside MCV interpretation is important for you because when do you want to treat these patients, you want to know what is microcytosis and what is macrocytosis. And this has been touched upon briefly in the previous talks. So just use these simple formulas and it is given in the IAP guidelines for management of nutritional anemias. And if you use these formulas, you are able to kind of get a rough idea of what the MCV should be. And you'll be able to say whether the patient has microcytosis or macrocytosis. And a peripheral smear helps you to make a diagnosis. Like in this particular case, we can, you can see a lot of central pallor and small cells. RDW will be high in nutritional anemias and RBC count will be low. So iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, both will have a low uh, um, 
uh, RBC count. So when you talk about management, first thing is you have to make a diagnosis correctly. And I will not do this in great detail because Richa has talked about it. So very important is to look at the MCV RDW, which will be in the opposite direction and iron, which will be low. And the easiest thing that we can do, one test if we have to do is the serum ferritin. And I always emphasize that this is a very important test but we should avoid doing it at the time when a patient is infected or inflamed because at that time it will be spuriously high. Now, the, the, the guidelines clearly mention the uh, cutoffs for a serum ferritin, so less than 12 and less than 15 for the different age groups. We can see that with infection, the cutoff can be up to 30 because a little bit rise can be there. Serum transfer in saturation less than 16% for adults and a reticulocyte hemoglobin, which is the newer parameter, would be less than 29. Percentage of hypochromic cells is again a newer parameter. Looking at the functional iron availability, it should be more than 5% to call it as an iron deficiency anemia. Now, reticulocyte hemoglobin is now available at our center. And for the last four or five years, we have been using that. And it is very helpful to pick early iron deficiency and also to see the early response to treatment. But if you do not have availability of this test, still with the basic evaluation, you are easily able to make a diagnosis of iron deficiency. So once you have made the diagnosis of iron deficiency, you want to treat. So Richa clearly said that ferrous salts are preferred. But again, you know, we have many other salts available, which are gluconate, fumarate, ascorbate, and we use them all the time with almost similar efficacy. The iron therapy should be given at 2 to 3 mg per kg. In fact, if your patient is not tolerating, the key is to give the iron and not stop the iron because of the side effect. Even if you give at 1 mg per kg, but persist with it and not stop it early and keep giving it and you know, try to manage the side effects, you will have a successful iron rise in your patient. Give for two to three months after the hemoglobin has normalized. The enteric coated delayed release and the liposomal irons are not recommended. And I'll come to that in a bit. The first checkup should be done by seven days in cases of severe anemia. And then 14 days where there is mild to moderate anemia to see if the patient is able to uh, handle it. Avoid milk, tea, curd, antacid, proton pump inhibitors, calcium with your iron therapy. So if you have to really give it, give it at a different time, but not with the iron. The response of iron uh, deficiency anemia can be monitored by first looking at the clinical response, which starts within a day. Irritability goes down. Nobody checks the bone marrow response. We don't have to do the invasive test. Look at the retics. They start coming up by five to seven days. And then the hemoglobin starts rising by 0.25 to 0.4 grams per deciliter per day. And after 10 days, it goes at a little relatively slower rate. So by one month, most of the patients would have a rise of at least one gram per deciliter if you are giving iron therapy properly. Now, the newer iron formulation is the talk of the town and everybody wants to know about that. The companies are marketing them in a big way. They'll always be standing at your um, uh, clinics and promoting their expensive products. But are they really helpful? So the first is the oral liposomal iron. Now, iron salts like ferrous, pyrophosphate are covered with a liposome. It's a spherical structure of the phospholipidic nature. These liposomes are used as car carriers and the iron never comes in contact with the gastrointestinal mucosa and that is why the side effects may be little less. The liposome is incorporated by the endocytosis by macrophages and through the lymphatic system, it reaches intact to the hepatocytes where the liposome is opened by the, lipo by the lysosomal enzymes and the iron is available. Now, when the initial studies were done, they showed that liposomal iron was 2.7 to 3.5 times more bioavailable than ferrous sulfate that was, that was um, you know, uh, identified. And then, you know, there were a couple of other studies which kind of looked at the uh, bioavailability of this product. So uh, clinically, it was mainly used for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, and patients with chronic uh, kidney disease where it was studied. Now, wherever the studies were done, it found that the bioavailability of this drug was good the side effects of this drug was good. But the rise of hemoglobin was not as good as the intravenous iron therapy for CKD patients. This was a clear randomized trial. 
and it showed that you know with the iv the patients were having a better rise in hemoglobin so similar way many other products were looked at which had higher bioavailability and lower gi side effects now a recent study which looked at oral iron therapy in children with iron deficiency anemia and looked at ferrous gluconate uh, sulfate as compared to uh, glycinate and liposomal group it was identified that liposomal iron revealed a poorer performance both at 2 weeks and 8 weeks from the point of view of rise in hemoglobin but the gi side effects were very very low so you know clearly it says that uh, these drugs are not as efficacious as our conventional iron preparations so if you use conventional iron preparation and your patient has side effect use it as at a very lower uh, dose and still your hemoglobin rise will be better than these more expensive uh, uh, you know sachets that you are using uh, an 8 mg sachet costs somewhere around 157 rupees and clearly you know for an indian patient who has severe nutritional anemia whose diet only is very inadequate to afford this much expensive medication the chance of poor compliance is going to be very very high uh you know stick to your good diet uh we do we are not really red meat eaters so a lot of other options are available and if we kind of give them a chart or something like that which are easily available on net maybe you know a pictorial representation of what are iron rich foods will be helpful for the patients a lot of plant foods also have iron a lot of fancy foods also have iron uh, but again i would say that you know stick to your basics and most of the times you know you will get some good iron from your diet now you know the whole traditional um, uh, uh, cooking in the iron utensils has gone the jaggery also that we get is not really the real true jaggery which was cooked in iron utensils so we have a little bit of an issue with an oral iron preparation and that is why india has got huge amount of iron deficiency with lot of carbohydrate based diet so what if oral iron does not work so uh, richa has touched on this and i will not go in details because of lack of time but i just wanted to highlight like this one patient who came to us with anemia microcytic hypochromic had some joint pains and we were wondering we thought maybe it is a leukemia because you know there were bony pains and anemia and a little bit of leukocytosis it was not a very classical picture but we found too much iron in the bone marrow so it was a uh, you know very retrograde way of looking at it uh, but this patient actually you know had a ckd so the iron excess iron in the marrow was because of the uh, ckd so you know this can be a reason and sometimes you will not do a kidney function test because you just dealing with an anemia and you will find a ckd in a patient so anemia of chronic disease she has touched upon it is a very important dd for such a situation the other case again you know um, um, uh, richa has shown is a case of a pulmonary hemosiderosis so you know a child who comes with breathing difficulty recurrent anemia please think about it and this is one case where you know you are uh, uh, you are treating anemia but the child is losing so much that your oral iron is not working and steroids actually fix this patient lead poisoning hookworm infestation celiac disease ibd intestinal polyps are other important causes one of the other rare causes is sideroblastic anemia like seen in this patient with microcytic anemia where the marrow showed a sideroblast and you know just treatment with high dose pyridoxine fix this child's neurological outcome as well alpha thalassemia is another important cause for a uh, iron therapy not working so again it will be microcytic hypochromic anemia and sometimes you are able to diagnose golf like inclusion bodies but genetic testing is now available for um, Uh, alpha thalassemia and we are able to diagnose it so when you talk about iron therapy please look at all these causes and this may lead to um, you know non um, um, working of your oral iron the evolving science has shown like the case showed by richa uh, um, you know uh, the iron refractory iron deficiency anemia where the patient has received a lot of iron he has severe microcytosis ferritin is not very low and in such a patient you know suspect irida and by doing a genetic testing you are able to confirm uh, irida and uh, you know parenteral iron therapy works for these patient now parenteral iron therapy again when do you use it 
wherever you have inadequate patient compliance, where the oral therapy is ineffective, where there is impaired absorption, like, you know, all the autoimmune causes or, uh, you know, we have, we have seen a lot of patients who have had bariatric surgeries, you know, having iron and B12 deficiency anemia, celiac disease, inadequate absorption uh, because of, you know, some short gut syndrome and all those things. And, you know, you need a rapid correction for surgery. And there is, um, uh, you know, um, lack of uh, loss of excess amount of uh, blood like, you know, um, menorrhagia. And, you know, you're not able to control that. And these are uterine bleeding, mucosal telangiectasia, chronic kidney diseases. These will be indications for using parenteral iron therapy. The advantage of iron, IV iron is that it acts fast. It is safe, you know, if we don't talk about dextran, which causes anaphylaxis. Generally, the newer iron preparations are safe and it is effective in gut absorption issues. The cons are that it needs a healthcare professional. Cost goes up. Uh, there is a potential for iron overload. Uh, there is oxidative stress. And again, anaphylaxis can be a pro problem. So we have a lot of preparations available for parenteral iron therapy. The common ones that are used are NC carb and gelazo. Gelazo is a bit expensive. It is iron isomaltoside, uh, and NC carb is the ferric carboxy maltose. You also have iron sucrose, so sorbitol, and dextrans are the one which can cause. We have standard formulas of how to cal calculate the iron dose, and I will not go into details for that. A short, um, um, you know, check by giving to make sure that the patient is not having an anaphylaxis, a test dose is recommended, uh, and allergies is really the main thing. IM injections can be painful. It can lead to discoloration of that area, and we these are some of the things, but, you know, where, wherever we have very difficult patients and we need to give them uh, iron, you know, these newer drugs uh, have come as very handy, and we have a few children with inflammatory bowel disease presently who get regular IV iron in our ward. Now, briefly coming on to B12 and folic acid. So, you know, um, um, Vibha has shown what a smear in a B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency looks like. So I will not go into details of that. And hyperpigmented nickels, is, knuckles is something we see. We often do not have to do a bone marrow because, you know, we are able to diagnose with a good peripheral smear and the levels. Uh, but always keep DDs in your mind whenever you look at B12, uh, macrocytic anemias. And some of these have been elaborated by Vibha in her uh, case series. So coming on to investigating these patients, cobalamin and folate assay should be done simultaneously. And serum folate level should be first estimated than RBC folate, which is actually a better test, but doing RBC folate can be tricky and it is not easily available. So sometimes, you know, when your uh, serum folate level is uh, is okay, you know, an RBC folate can be handy. A good, good meal uh, sometimes brings up the uh, folic acid level very quickly. Uh, one tablet or one syrup that has been given by a previous pediatrician may spuriously, you know, kind of bring the transient rise in folate level. And you may think, oh, folate is okay why do we have to give folate but that is just a transient rise in the folate level now the other fancy tests are homocysteine and methyl malonic acid levels now we don't really have to do these tests daily in our routine practice but if you have a doubtful diagnosis this can be helpful both of them will be low in b12 deficiency and only homocysteine will be um, raised uh, and MMA will be normal in cases of folate deficiency. So this also has got some role in diagnosing B12 and folate acid deficiency. Now coming to treatment. Now I must say that the treatment in children for B12 and folic acid is not standardized. Now everybody uses different types of protocols, whatever protocol suits you. The key is that we use lower doses of B12, start with B12 first and then add uh, uh, folate. Giving very high doses of B12 can precipitate hypokalemia, can precipitate neurological problems, especially in younger children. Now, B12 should be started at least 10 to 14 days before the addition of folic acid. And folic acid should not be instituted directly if B12 has not been ruled out, mainly to, pre to avoid precipitation of uh, neurological symptoms. The root, now parenteral is preferably administered by IM or subcutaneous roots. But nowadays we have very good oral vitamin B12 and a lot of patients can be managed just with oral B12 uh, uh, as compared to the parenteral therapy. Now, if you want that the rise should be very fast, if the patient is pancytopenic, 
if the patient has got a lot of neurological problems you know those are the situations or you think that you know the oral is not going to work because of uh, some gut issues in those cases parenteral can be uh, given and im is generally pre preferred the doses are 500 microgram per day in infants and 1000 microgram in older children if you are using the oral preparation this dose may be given every day for a week every other day for the next week two times a week then once a week then once in 15 days for a month and then once a month to complete at least three months alternatively daily oral vitamin b12 for three months can be given at 500 micrograms when you talk about parenteral the doses are less 25 microgram of b12 given daily by im root uh, uh, for initial two to three days, this is followed by 100 microgram of parenteral B12 given daily for next seven days, followed by 100 microgram vitamin B12 IM subcutate or IV on alternate days for seven days and followed by 1000 micrograms vitamin B12 given IM deep subcut IV every week over the next one month. Now, I, I want to say that this is pretty tricky and this is quite complicated. So you can start off with parenteral for the first two, three days. Make sure that your patient is okay. The immediate crisis is sorted out and then you can put them on oral therapy. The folic acid recommendations from the British guidelines are one to five mg and uh, you know the duration is almost three to five uh, months again there is a lot of variation natural sources of b12 vegetarians have you know very limited source of b12 and it's mainly you know milk and dairy products but non-vegetarians can get their b12 from the diet and folic acid we all know that you know fresh leafy vegetables green vegetables nuts seeds all have got a lot of uh, folic acid so that should not really be a problem we should avoid goat's milk as described by Bhavna. so the recommendations have recently been published and i would reco re uh, you know really recommend all the pediatricians to go through these recommendations which nicely elucidate uh, to all these aspects as far as prevention of uh, a nutrition anemia is concerned, that's again a very big topic that, uh, uh, you know, Shirisha has given me and I'll not go into much details of that, but I would say that essentially it is anemia mukt bharat that we need to, you know, a kind of emphasize to our um, um, society and, you know, we being pediatricians and pediatric hematologists, we need to kind of re-emphasize to our uh, you know, peripheries that, you know, this is very important and we need to do all this iron and folic acid supplementation, deworming, delayed cord, cord uh, blood camp, uh, clamping. And these are some, you know, the, the, the government has come up with a very nice strategy of, you know, uh, coming up, but it is just the compliance that becomes a problem. And a lot of these tablets are just thrown away because there are just, uh, you know, people having uh, all these uh, wrong notions about uh, oral iron therapy. There are targets which have been set and, you know, we need to uh, uh, focus on this. And, um, you know, the service delivery platform by prophylactic dose and the test and tra uh, treat strategy dose is also quite robust. It is just that, you know, we need to implement it. The planning is good, but that execution level, sometimes we kind of, uh, you know, get back and, and uh, we are not able to uh, correct the nutrition anemia in our country. The iron supplementation is bi-weekly by the Anemia Mukt Bharat program. And it is in the form of a syrup or in a form of a tablet based on the age. And it targets women of reproductive age, uh, adolescent boys and girls and children across uh, right from the six months of age. Deworming also has been started and that also needs to be done because in India, the whole worm infestation burden is also very huge. And there is an emphasis on delayed cord blood clamping uh, whenever it is possible in the labor rooms. So, uh, you know, if we are focusing on all these strategies and we are able to implement that, them at the ground uh, level, hopefully we will have a anemia mukt bharat. Thank you. Thank you, Manas. It's always a treat to listen to you. Uh, for, uh, it's a nice elaborative talk on touching on all treatment aspects as well as uh, partly definitely preventive aspects as well. So we all need to remember that we need to choose a formula which is more practical to us, like which is has been highlighted by Dr. Richa as well as Barnes on uh, uh, being like, you know, ferrous sulfate and then other formulas are also there. Polymaltose complex in you, if you have GA side effects and liposomal, definitely expensive. One can keep as a backup, especially when the 
patient is not ready for parenteral, but otherwise you have parenteral option even if you have uh, conditions like peer absorption defects mm -hmm. uh, and tolerance uh, issues and renal issues. So in those, you do have parenteral options. But at the same time, if a patient is not ready for parenteral, then you do have a, a liposomal as a backup uh, that we need to remember. So after uh, anemia uh, uh, on microcytic and macrocytic and the preventive aspects and management, we will move on to hemolytic, important hemolytic anemia. There are various hemolytic anemias like hemoglobinopathies, membrane defects, enzyme defects. So we do have all those like hemoglobinopathies we are going to discuss in the panel discussion. But now next we will move on to autoimmune hemolytic anemia uh, by Dr. Siddharth. But before that, if you have any questions to Dr. Manas, we will take, a, uh, take up those questions. I think there is one question. Mm. So why we uh, see only knuckle uh, pigmentation only in B12 deficiency? Pathophysiology, sir. This has been asked by Dr. Lakshman once again. I am um, not sure why. Uh, Dr. Viba, one of you can answer. Sure. Anybody, if you know, if you know why this happens, I'm I not think sure. I think it is. I remember reading some time back with the melanin uh, uh, pathway. So I forget the details, but I think there is some common pathway where the melanin is affected, and there is increase in melanin. And then already, you know, physiologically, we have our knuckles where there is a concentration of pigment. So probably that. I think that's my guess. <laughs> okay. I, I tried yeah, to look at it sometimes, but I could not really find what really yeah, it was exactly. just an observation. Exactly. I don't know if uh, Shirisha, Siddharth, or um, uh, uh, I can see Parinita also, if anybody and, wants to. And it is very strange that only in the nutritional B12 folic acid deficiency you see it. And if you see congenital uh, disorders or inborn errors of metabolism, somehow it's not there. I, I mean, it's very strange. Probably it takes some time in coming and those children manifest early. Or... Yeah, so I agree with Vibha. I think it's uh, related to melanin metabolism. So the pathophysiology, I think we need to look at in detail. Uh, so the next question is to Dr. Manas uh, on like, what is the minimum age to start a parental iron in a child where it is indicated? I don't so, think there is you know, age. there is no such minimal age where you have to give para, where you can or cannot give parenteral iron therapy. I think it is just the fear of anaphylaxis, which makes us, uh, you know, not use this modality of therapy. Uh, with the newer preparations, the risk of anaphylaxis is very less. We have used it for many, many patients. And I think we need to just dose adjust and use uh, at a lower dose based on, you know, the age and calculate it appropriately. And I don't think we have such cutoffs which can be used. The issue is that, you know, we do not have safety data for very young children because it is not commonly used for very young children. Most often oral iron therapy works for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we we did use like for a age of even one and a half to two years, but definitely for infants, we will be a bit uncomfortable to use, as you said, like for anaphylaxis reactions and all. So uh, now, uh, any other questions? I think uh, we have. An, yeah, thank you, Manas for such a nice presentation and touching on the, all the practical aspects. Now we'll move on to the talk by Dr. Siddharth Totadri. He is an assistant professor in uh, pediatric hematology oncology in uh, CMC Vellore. He is going to enlighten us on the important topic and difficult topic that is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. What is the difficulties in diagnosis and management? Over to you, Dr. Siddharth. Uh, are my slides visible? Can you see the yes. slides? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sirisha, for this opportunity. And thank you to the Twin Cities IAP program for arranging this session. So today I'll be talking about autoimmune hemolytic anemias, the diagnosis and uh, difficulties involved in the management of this. And I hope that at the end of this talk, when you see a child with AIHA, you will not see, say IO. So uh, I will take you to the introduction to the topic, types of the autoimmune hemolytic anemia, what are the clinical manifestations, 
how we investigate, treat, and what is the importance of recognizing secondary causes in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So as we all know, what is this NTIT? Autoantibodies are being generated to the endogenous red blood cell antigens, which leads to premature red blood cell destruction and anemia. So what is crucial to managing a child with autoimmune hemolytic anemia is that you should know what is the type of the antibody, which I will talk to you about, whether it is a warm reacting antibody or a cold agglutinin disease or a paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria. And you should also know whether we are dealing with a primary autoimmune hemolytic anemia or whether it is part of another systemic disorder. So if you see this uh, flow chart, this is a basic to understand the pathophysiology of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So broadly, the antibodies which can be uh, causing the autoimmune hemolytic anemia could be a IgG or an IgM antibody. So if the IgG antibody is going to bind to the RBC antigen and act at 37 degrees, that is a uh, room temperature, then you get warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So here, the IgG antibodies will bind to the red blood cells and they will be opsonized by the splenic macrophages. So here the hemolysis is happening extravascularly in the spleen. Also, the antibodies will fix complement on the red blood cells and these will also be op opsonized by the splenic macrophages. So to understand that warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is an IgG mediated hemolysis, which is going to happen predominantly in the spleen. And this is the commonest category that we encounter. Now, the other IgG mediated autoimmune hemolytic anemia sometimes will bind at a low temperature but act at the room temperature and that leads to what is called a paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea where the antibody is called donatlanciner antibody and this is nowadays seen predominantly in children. This is a complement mediated intravascular self-limited uh, self hemolysis. And finally, sometimes we may have an IgM mediated antibody. Now this IgM antibody is a pentameric antibody so it can actually bind five red blood cells at the same time and therefore lead to RBC agglutination. And this, rather than working directly like IgG, it leads to complement mediated hemolysis. So here hemolysis can either be extravascular where the liver macrophages will recognize the red cells and destroy them, or there will also be a comp uh, component of complement mediated intravascular hemolysis. And also because here there is a peculiar phenomenon of RBC agglutination, Peripheral smear will show the typical role of formation of the RBC agglutinates. Also, other than hemolysis, RBC agglutinates can lead to peripheral circulation obstruction leading to what is known as a Reynolds phenomenon and acrocyanosis. But this last category is predominantly seen in adults rather than children. Now, this is a rare uh, hematological disorder seen in around 2 per million children. And uh, in infants and toddlers, mostly we see primary autoimmune hemolytic hemolytic triggered by recent viral infection, just like ITP, which we are more familiar with. In adolescents, we should be very wary that it might be a possible underlying secondary disorder. The warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is the commonest type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And the cold agglutinin disease, like I told you before, is primarily an adult disease, very rare in children. And the paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, now that syphilis is almost not seen at all, it has become a primarily pediatric disorder seen around in five-year-old children after some infections. And around five to 10 years back, this was actually a disease which used to lead to mortality in more than 10% of patients. But with good diagnosis and treatment modalities, the mortality has come down significantly. So how does it manifest? Typically, the onset is acute to dramatic. So this is in comparison to other common congenital hemolytic anemias like thalassemia, hereditary sclerocytosis, where you will have a more prolonged uh, history when the child comes to you. Here, the present is usually acute or maybe episodic also. And in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there might be a remitting, relapsing course. Whereas in pediatric paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria and cold agglutinin disease, it is a so usually a self-limited disease. And obviously, the predominant the symptom is anemia, which manifests with pallor and easy fatigability. And often because the child comes with severe anemia, you might have tachycardia, flow murmur and gallop rhythm. But remember, frank congestive failure is not very typically seen in this condition. Often jaundice will be picked up in the form of ictress in the examination or from the history. Often there will be a complaint of high colored urine, but this is usually the bilirubinuria seen in extravascular hemolysis. 
Occasionally, you can have the typical cola colored urine, which signifies intravascular hemolysis in the paroxysmal cold hemoglobin and cold agglutinin disease. Usually, we should remember splenomegaly is mild to moderate. We don't see very huge spleens in autumn and If, if the, such a huge splenomegaly is there, you should worry about some other underlying diagnosis. And again, hepatomegaly uh, being very large is not a very typical feature in this condition. You might have some fever as part of the immune phenomenon, some headache because of the anemia. And when there is an intravascular hemolysis component, you might have some peculiar symptoms like back pain and tenderness in the costovertebral ankle. So coming to a case we treated, this was a three-year-old boy noticed by the parents to be pale and listless since the recent two weeks. And as a single child with pallor and spinomaglion examination, and he came to our center because his local hospital could not arrange compatible blood. And this, uh, my friends, this should be a red flag that this is very likely an autoimmune hemolytic anemia because it is very difficult to arrange blood in a child who has this disease. So this was the investigations we got in this child. So this is what you can expect to see in a child with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You will have marked anemia with a low red blood cell count. It is common to have some leukocytosis, but remember that sometimes the WBC count might be very high in hemolytic anemias due to nucleated red blood cells. So always when you have such high WBCs, always make sure you have a peripheral smear seen by your pathologist and if the NRBCs are there you have to correct for the NRBC count and an actual WBC count might be actually not so high and here the anemia is usually normocytic normochromic although sometimes when the retic count is very high you might have a mild increase in MCV but there sometimes you might see MCV as high as 120, 130, 140 then you have to remember that it could be an RBC agglutination due to IgM antibodies and always look at the smear for roller formation that is a spurious high MCV. Retic count is almost always high. I know all the textbooks will talk about this reticulocyte production index being corrected for the maturation factor and PCV but let me tell you I never use this in my uh, clinical bedside or OPD practice. If you look at the absolute retic count and it is high you can take it as high but you remember that in this autoimmune medical anemia around one third can have a low retic count because sometimes antibodies will also affect the bone marrow precursors. Peripheral smear will be showing spherocytes in warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia because you know there the spleen is causing the hemolysis whereas in cold agglutinin disease the pentameric IgM will lead to RBC agglutination. Other non-specific findings include nucleated RBCs, polychromacy because of retic count and fragmented red cells. So this is a picture of you can see the spherocytes where there is loss, loss of the central pallor in warm autumn and And this is a picture of cold agglutinin disease where you can see the classical RBC agglutinates. Then the most important next test you do is a direct Coombs test. So any child coming with acute episodic anemia, we will do a CBC retic count smear and a DCT in the first prick. So what is this test? Basically, you can see the picture. These red things are the red blood cells and the blue Y-shaped molecules are the autoantibodies which bind to the red blood cells. So what we do in the DCT, we add the green color Y molecules, which are the antibodies to human antiglobulins. So these antiglobulin antibodies will bind together all the red cells coated by the autoantibodies and lead to RBC agglutination, which manifests as a clot formation in the DCT. So uh, once we know the DCT is possible, it is always important to do a monospecific DCT to see what is the culprit which is actually causing the hemolysis, whether it is IgG, whether it is complement. So based on this, if IgG is present with or without complement, it is warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If IgG is negative and only complement is detected, then we should do cold agglutinin titer. If it is elevated, it is cold agglutinin disease. And if it is undetectable, then it is likely to be paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea. But remember, a small proportion might be DCT negative because of low immunoglobulin levels or a non-IgG antibody or some technical issues. And remember, if there is no anemia, no retic count elevation, no preplexmal evidence of hemolysis, simply having a DCT positivity is not enough to label a patient as having autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So coming back to our case, the DCT was uh, strongly positive and our monospecific uh, DAT also was positive for IgG uh, and complement and therefore was also warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The other tests illustrate what I do in my practice when I suspect hemolysis. LDH will be very elevated. There will be unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Typically, AST will be more than 
ALT in uh, autoimmune hemolysis and creatinine should be done because sometimes, especially intravascular hemolysis, you can have pigmentary nephropathy in elevated creatinine. Urine routine can be done to look for red blood cells and hemoglobinuria. So how to treat? Remember, it is a restricted transition strategy. If the child has more than six hemoglobin, if it is hemodynamically stable, there needs, need not be any hurry in transfusing the child. But if it is less than six, you might want to give the least incompatible blood after discussing with your transition medicine colleague. As far as possible, it's good to do an extended phenotyping of the red blood cells before transfusing. They beautifully respond to corticosteroids when there is a warm antibody, either predominantly or as part of a mixed autoimmune hemolytic anemia. They sometimes don't have IgG and IgM present in the same patient in mixed type, but they still respond to steroids. 80% will respond and by within two weeks, you will see the response by elevation of hemoglobin and decrease in the retic count, but only 40% sustained it by around one year. So we start at 2MG per kg per day of oral prednisolone, give full doses for a good time period of around two to four weeks and then take very slowly over six months. So unlike ITP, where the recommendation is to stop very quickly after giving steroids, in autoimmune hemodynamic, you have to be very gradual with the taper. And usually we would not taper and stop before a period of six months. And you can monitor with HP and retic count. Um, Methylpednisolone can be used in sick patients, unstable patients for a quick response at a dose of 30 mg per kg per day. Most of the textbooks will show a dose of 1 to 2 mg per kg per day, sixth hourly. However, it has been our practice to use this dose and it does work well in unstable patients. Remember, when you're giving steroids for a long time, you have to watch out for the adverse events like neurocognitive changes, weight gain, uh, hypertension, bone, bone health. And it is good after three months of steroids, it's good to do an off the evaluation for cataract and increased intraocular pressure. Also watch out for infectious complications because when you give steroids for a long time, they're prone to infections. IVIG is not a recommended first line therapy in autoimmune hemodynamia, unlike ITP, you might use it if there is poor response to steroids. The second line recommended drug is rituximab when steroids fail. You can use it at the conventional dose of 375 mg per meter square per week for four weeks. And um, usually the response is evident in three, three to six weeks. So note it because the response takes time. We should also start steroids and taper it slowly by the time rituximab starts work. So you cannot use rituximab as a standalone agent. You will have to start steroids and then taper it by the time rituximab starts taking action. Uh, if uh, both steroid and rituximab fails, then splenectomy is also an option where around 70% might achieve remission. But remember, if there's a mixed autoimmune hemolytic anemia, don't do splenectomy because the IgM or the complement components will not benefit with the splenectomy. There are so many drugs which have been used uh, in refractory autoimmune hemolytic but there is very anecdotal evidence like azathioprine, mycoprene, mofetil, cyclosporin, everything. But uh, I mean, none of them have been proven to be better than the other. Uh, recently, we had a small baby who was refractory to therapy to steroids and rituximab. And because he was just around six months old and we were worried to do a spinectomy, we had actually given botizumab. And after four weeks of botizumab, the child actually achieved remission and is uh, doing still well. So botismo is actually an attractive available option. There are also a lot of novel monoclonal antibodies, which I don't want to talk about because they're really not available in the market and, uh, you know, useful for us on a practical basis. And remember, if the steroid response is very good, you can bring it down to a very low dose of around 2.5 mg alternate days and keep that going for around even a year, um, which should be okay and tolerated by the child. Remember a very severe anemia, Evan syndrome, where there is concomitant thrombocytopenia and mixed autoimmune treatment, there is a high chance of relapse. And when a child has Evan syndrome or a renal failure or child has been treated with multiple lines of therapy, making him more and more immunocompromised, there is even a chance of death. Regarding cold agglutinins, it is usually self-limited, follows infections, and you can treat it largely with supportive care and by keeping the child warm. And the only severe cases require therapeutic plasplexion, usually recoveries the norm. Similarly, paroxysmal cold hemoglobin, just self-limited, keep the child warm and stop the steroids. Usually they recover spontaneously after maybe maximum one or two transfusions. So in our index case, we had warm autumn, we gave prednisolone, tapered it over six months, but he came back with a relapse. So actually started azathioprine, but despite that, the hemoglobin fell and then we gave him rituximab. And now he's doing quite well after rituximab on a very low dose of prednisolone. This is another case we saw recently where a four-year-old boy came with fever and a typical cola-colored urine, which actually significant is having a 
uh, intravascular hemolysis. And before the mentos itself, we had received IVIG, methylprednisolone, and transfusions. So, and outside, these are all the outside investigations. DCT was positive. Here, when we did the monospecific DCT, we found only complement was positive. Cold agglutin was negative. So, this was a typical paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea. We rapidly tapered the steroids, and now he is doing well after six months, on, not on any drugs. Now, coming to the last part of the talk, secondary autonomic recommend. These are quick case scenarios which we saw in our OPD. A 16 year old boy came to us with DCT post 1 email with retic count being elevated. He had significantly large cervical nodes on examination. And when we did the excision biopsy, it confirmed classic logical lymphoma. So, in pediatrics, one malignancy which is has a definite association with autonomic hemodynamia as a paraneoplastic phenomenon is Hodgkin's lymphoma. Another six-year-old girl who had come with DCT positive anemia who responded to serous but kept relapsing three times before coming to CMC. We she had a very huge splenomegaly around eight centimeters below the costal margin. And when we went through all her records on several locations, we found the platelet count was also dropping. And then we suspected autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, and it was confirmed by flow cytometry showing elevated DNT cells. So remember when there is concomitant thrombocytopenia and also when there is uh, unexplained lymphadenopathy and very big splenomegaly, think of ALPS. And 10-year-old girl who came with severe pallor jaundice and uh, pancytopenia and alopecia, she was identified to have lupus erythematosus based on ANA and anti-DS DNA. So remember, 25 to 50 percent of pediatric autonomic can be secondary, especially with increasing age, you have to suspect more and more. SLE always look for alopecia, rash, oral ulcers, musculoskeletal symptoms, and other cytopenias and other autoimmune phenomenon. And when you have very young children, less than one year, having other cytopenias, infections in the history, it is good to suspect immunodeficiencies. And it's good to do HIV in all children and immunoglobulin levels whenever there is a recurrent refractory case or uh, infections. Uh, the common inborn errors of immunity associated with IHA are common variable immunodeficiency, selective IgA deficiency, and even viscot syndrome. And whenever you have chronic lymphadenopathy and uh, large spleen um, or coexistent thrombosis, you always rule out ALPS. And when you have significant lymphadenopathy, significant hepatostomegaly, musculoskeletal symptoms, it's good to do a bone marrow before starting steroids. Drug exposure can also lead to hemolytic, particularly ceftriaxone is a common drug which can lead to and which is used very commonly. So look for that in the history. And another common pitfall we see is when a child has anemia, thrombosis, and high retic count, even when DCT is negative, they are misdiagnosed as uh, you know immune disease and treated with steroids. But you should always look for schistocytes in the peripheral smear. And if they are positive, remember this will be HUS TTP spectrum and not an autoimmune disease. And whenever there is consanguinity in the parents, be very wary that this might be some in, uh, inherited disorder going on. So some tests which I do not do in my practice, I just wanted to say I don't do viral serologies like EBV, CMV, parvovirus because ultimately the treatment depends on what type of autoantibody you are dealing with and uh, not on what virus caused the autoimmune hemolysis. And bone marrow need not be done if there is no clinical suspicion of leukemia. Haptoglobin very popularly done, but I believe if there is a colocolored urine, which I can see with my own eyes, and urine hemoglobin hemocytin can be done with peripherals showing RBC agglutinins, that is enough to diagnose the intravascular hemolysis going on. And sometimes we see an entire panel of tests like hemoglobin variant analysis and osmotic fragility and everything done in a child who comes with an acute history and DST positivity and high reticone. In that case, it is that, that is just enough to label the child as autoimmune hemolytic anemia. What I do is definitely get viral serologies because I'm uh, medical legally we're going to transfuse. It is good to have a baseline and also rule out HIV always. ANA I prefer to do in all children irrespective of whether symptoms are there or not. And if there are there is recurrence in typical clinical features, we'll do Ig levels and autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome worker. B12 folic acid is good to do because it's you can treat as a bystander causing a worsening of the anemia. So the take-home message at the end of my talk is any DST positive anemia with elevated retic count, you have to suspect and manage for autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And we have to do a monospecific DAT and see if it is warm or cold or paroxysmal cold hemoglobin urea to plan the treatment. Look for red flags, which will indicate secondary causes, particularly significant lymphadenopathy, uh, any huge hepatosinomegaly, musculoskeletal pains, or any severe infections in the past history, or a pancytopenia. And remember, when you have a warm or mixed hemolysis, go for a steroids at the first line. And if it doesn't work, go for rituximab by second line. If it is cold like gluten disease or paroxysmal cold hemoglobin, they're usually self-limited and they will recover with time. These are my uh, references. Uh, thank you very much, Manson.
Thank you, Dr. Siddharth, for such a nice uh, lucid presentation, uh, elaborating on all uh, aspects, like you know, when to suspect the underlying causes. Secondly, because we know that uh, most of the times, though it is primary, significant percentage also like uh, in children, secondary causes we need to look at, especially autoimmune immunodeficiencies in our population, in pediatric population, as well as the underlying malignancies we need to rule out. And diagnosis, most of the times, uh, you know, uh, it's a high acute or hyperacute presentation. And at times, your blood bank colleagues will give you diagnosis that they are unable to cross match. Child is symptomatic in front of you and you would like to transfuse and then you are unable to cross match. That gives you clue towards the diagnosis. So this kind of a hyperacute presentation needs to be addressed immediately. So uh, we have to go ahead and do the appropriate investigations, what you have already listed. And bone marrow test is, uh, you know, red flag signs you have already mentioned when to do. But majority of the people, they go ahead and do it because they require long-term steroids, not like a ITP where you give only three weeks of steroids here. You end up giving per few months, at least four to six months, going by that majority of the hemato-oncology people, they go ahead and do the bone marrow. And some prefer not to if they are comfortable with the overall clinical picture. So uh, with this uh, interesting uh, talks, like uh, four talks by the eminent speakers, we will move on to the panel discussion. Uh, if there are any questions for Dr. Siddharth, we can take up. But I think it's very clear that, you know, there are no questions. Shirisha, <laughs> so, can but... I just make one comment? Yes, Shirisha, please. just one comment. You know, um, yes, Siddharth, Siddharth mentioned that, but I just want to say that, you know, unlike ITP and other uh, disorders where we use very high doses of steroids, most of the time with um, AIHA, instead of the 30 mg per kg pulse, we are able to manage with a very low dose IV steroid also. So sometimes when the child is sick, I give, you know, 2 to 5 mg per kg of IV methyl prednisolone. And with that also, the patient kind of stabilizes. So, you know, we can avoid too much of steroids in this particular scenario because the therapy is going to be much longer than, you know, your usual ITP. So absolutely, Manas. Yeah, so the dose we use also like 8 mg per kg as per the Nathanoski recommendation, 8 mg per kg per day in 2 to 3 divided doses, we go ahead and give. And then it requires longer maintenance, uh, though initial pulse is at lower dose. Okay. So let's move on to panel discussion now in the best interest of time. I already, we are running very late. Um, I'll share my screen. So can, can you see my screen? Okay, yeah. So as we all know, like uh, one of the important problem which is preventable is uh, thalassemia major, one of the important uh, cause of hemoglobinopathy, like an anemia and then hemoglobinopathy is thalassemia major, which is easily preventable, but we have a overburden in the society managing these children in terms of transfusion, chelation, and even transplantation. So there are various aspects related to this. Uh, which we are going to discuss in this panel uh, in the next uh, few minutes. I'll skip this theory part, uh, moving on to uh, practical aspects right away. So this is a six months old uh, baby. Uh, sorry, uh, I did not introduce our panelists. Apologies for that. We have uh, four eminent panelists, panel experts to uh, go ahead. And uh, other than that, like our speakers are also welcome to add their comments if they would like to. The eminent uh, panel experts we have for this panel discussion is uh, Dr. Paranita Gutta uh, from American Oncology Institute and Dr. Virendra Patil from Indo-American Cancer Institute and uh, Dr. Varshini Bandi from uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital and Dr. Viba Bafna from uh, Bharati Vidya Pit, uh, Pune. Uh, so moving on to panel discussion. Uh, so we have a six months old boy who is born to consanguineous parents, presented with history of progressive pallor and on examination had a firm splenomegaly and hemoglobin was very low, 5.8 with MCV of 64 and high RDW. And uh, this is the peripheral smear picture, uh, Dr. Varshini. So how do you approach for differentials in this age group? 
and uh, what do you see in the smear uh, good morning everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank sirisha ma'am and the iap tcb twin cities for giving this opportunity so with the history of uh, in a infant with the consignment uh, parents and then uh, splenomegaly and presented with microcytic hypochromic picture in the peripheral smear also it is showing microcytic hypochromic with target cells uh, and uh, and isopoiclocytes so uh, first of all we think about uh, thalassemia being the age group but uh, we need to keep in mind of other uh, differentials also like it could be a simple iron deficiency anemia with any concrete uh, infections or any infection etiology causing this one splenomegaly uh, also and in fans with anemia we should even think about other hemolytic anemias also uh, but here the uh, um, like a dba could be presented in infancy but then the here it is a microcytic picture uh, which rules out and uh, any enzymopathies uh, but they are generally normocytic uh, here it is a microcytic uh, picture again saying again and uh, any other uh, like uh, hypersplenism to say but very small spin and very uh, early presentation so uh, infections and other things also we need to rule out and the uh, com common age of uh, presentation of thalassemia is generally 6 months to 2 years uh, they present with uh, similar complaints of uh, progressive paler recurrent infections uh, failure to thrive irritability not feeding properly these are the common symptoms they present uh, in this uh, age group thank you dr varshini so as she rightly pointed so uh, that's a classical age and splenomegaly a uh, firm splenomegaly with classical peripheral smear you do think of thalassemia but otherwise like when you first approach you need to approach like a uh, anemia related to deficiency hemolysis blood loss and reduced production in that with splenomegaly in that age like uh, um the you go ahead and think more in the line of thalassemia but as uh, she rightly pointed you also have to think of concomitant infection if there is a fever and then infection evidence it could be even uh, uh, your nutritional day anemia which is common at that age so however peripheral smear will uh, clinch the diagnosis here it is very classical and uh, uh, Risha, can so, i just make a practical point over here So, yes uh, what i think and in my practice i do that any infant presenting with a hemoglobin less than 7 so especially if you are giving blood i think you are justified in doing an hplc and ruling out a thalassemia it absolutely yeah, yeah because it is now so easily available and not even so costly so absolutely we do for every practical point for pediatricians i think that is a very important because so many times all of us have faced a scenario you know where the babies have received blood and uh hplc is not seen yeah so, yeah very true so all the anemias like by rule we should go ahead and send hplc unless otherwise you have clear blast in the peripheral smear and then it is anemia related to malignancy that is a different scenario but um, uh, as dr vibha rightly pointed as it is a preventable disease we should always screen for the uh, underlying thalassemias in all anemias So, uh, Dr. Virendra Patil, can you please tell us, like, what are the different tests you would like to do in this child? How do you approach uh, investigations in this child? Dr. Patil is here. so i think uh, moving on to the uh, this one the answer part like definitely we have to go ahead and look at uh, the all the investigations what has been highlighted in the previous talks look at what is hemoglobin level microcytosis hypochromia and then reticulocyte count and look at the other cell lines leukopenia thrombocytopenia usually seen in these children at the later stage when they develop a frank splenomegaly uh, in case if it is not managed well or if they are on chelation some of the chelators can cause cytopenias but otherwise leukopenia and thrombocytopenia you don't see in the beginning and examining the blood film is extremely important for all anemias as a hematologist we always uh, give utmost importance to blood film looking at the peripheral smear and then of course doing hplc will confirm the diagnosis your hbf will be very, very high 
you have to be very careful in interpreting hbf at this age hbf will be very high at birth and then gradually it comes to uh, less than 1% by 1 year by 6 months it will be it should be less than 10% but if you have a hbf or of around 70 80% or 90% at that age at 6 months with this classical picture you know that you are dealing with the uh, thalassemia major bone marrow and doing osmotic fragility are optional and of course you have to do certain biochemistry tests as well so uh, moving on to next question dr parinita gutta so can you please tell us what is the burden of the disease at uh, overall in the world as well as in india so we know that you know it is a huge burden on the society so can you tell us the actual figures and how we are struggling overall so um the it's a, it has a huge disease burden and it's a single most common uh, uh, single gene disorder in the world and about 3 lakh uh, the burden is about 3 lakh uh, um, uh, patients with thalassemia major in the world and uh, we are adding up up to 10000 children per year uh, to this pool in india so um, it's quite a big burden and uh, approximately the carrier state varies in various uh, regions but approximately it's about 3 to 3.5% carrier rate in india so um, if you look at a, a room full of 100 people three of us are carriers of this gene so carrier testing becomes very very important uh, and uh, it's recommended currently uh, general population as well as uh, especially in the antenatal period to prevent the, this disease and there are certain uh, countries which are free of thalassemia by implementing this uh, prevention strategies like cypress is a zero thalassemia country um so that that's it yeah so as you rightly said you know it is a huge burden in the society and we all know that like you know more than 10 years ago also we used to say more than 10000 children are adding to the pool but even now it is same but we are not able to cut down the numbers but the numbers are increasing so we all have to get up to the situation and then go ahead and screen them aggressively to prevent the thalassemia so uh moving on to next question uh dr vibha can you please outline the management when you first see the uh, child with thalassemia so how will you counsel them family overall like you know management in brief can you please tell us so uh, sirisha when we diagnose a child with thalassemia i mean most of the times it is a devastating news to give it's breaking bad news so first and foremost uh, you have to have a very good session with the family you have to first tell them what is this disease about because they are very anxious to know that what is wrong they mo- most of the times they end up blaming themselves you know they feel that they have done something wrong or the doctors have not diagnosed so you have to tell them about the genetic basis of this disorder then going on to management you have to tell them the importance of giving the right blood transfusion and that this child will require blood transfusions for life for survival the type of blood transfusions required then uh, after maybe one and a half to two years of age he will require chelation for the iron accumulation that is uh, the next part so basically the management of thalassemia has two arms first arm uh, is the blood transfusion and the second as important arm is about the chelation so while in this uh, child's journey another important part is the monitoring the regular monitoring by pediatricians and uh, expert uh, inputs from your hematology team so monitoring will be about the proper blood transfusion and chelation not just that but also monitoring for complications as the child goes uh, beyond 7 8 years of life you start monitoring for complications of iron depositions for example the cardiac uh complications the endocrine complications and so on and so forth uh at the outset we must also counsel the family about the curative options because uh they are now very easily available uh lots and lots of transplants are being done in our country and so many transplants are also being done on a very low cost setting and with total help from so many organizations so this we have to be the uh people who are going to bridge the gap between uh the proper treatment and what is required by our patients so that is a very important part and not to forget we have to tell them about antenatal diagnosis so laying out the genetic basis of disease and laying out how do you do antenatal uh, diagnosis especially if the family of this uh, this particular child is not complete 
then we have to at this onset we uh, have to not miss this opportunity about telling them that antenatal diagnosis is a must to prevent the birth of the future thalassemia child i mean i still see families with two thalassemia major children or three thalassemia major and that is a disaster on our part i usually blame our community and then another most important part is that you have to do the extended family screening i mean you have to tell the parents your extended even uh, second third fourth generation of cousins have to be told that they have to screen especially the uh, the young people of marriageable age have to screen for um, th uh, thalassemia carrier states as dr panit has just said yeah absolutely yeah so well, it's very important to tell them about the right management that is good transfusion program to ensure the good growth of the child and to ensure that the child will not grow into society with the hemolytic phases <laughs> and to ensure that there is no extra medullary hemopoiesis and huge organomegaly in the future so because this is like when they go to periphery they say that okay your hemoglobin is 9 you don't need transfusion now and then you come back when it falls to 6 or 7 so that is not the yeah. correct so we need to educate yeah. the parent you know the what is the right pro transfusion program and then gradually about the chelation and permanent solutions like hematopoietic uh, transplantation options everything we have to tell but at times it is difficult for them to take everything in yes. one go you have so to do multiple to, uh, sittings you have to take each and every opportunity opportunity you have to also recognize the family and what is their uh, ability to catch all the information yeah. and it is very important to touch the antenatal diagnosis in the beginning in the first counseling itself because Absolutely. we never know the you know in within few months or so you may get another thalassemia exactly. in the family so exactly. it was on the same family so it's very important to touch that aspect in the first counseling exactly so uh, dr parinita can you please tell us like how do you approach a child who comes to you in the post transfusion status which many times we do face yeah This this is quite common actually. Um, so if the child uh, comes to us with a post, I mean already transfused in the periphery, this commonly happens because they're quite compens uh, comp in a decompensated state. So um, if they if in the periphery, what the advice I would like to give is if you can send a HPLC before transfusing, but if that cannot be done, then and we are faced with this situation. Usually, if we are suspecting a hemoglobinopathy, it's um, uh, I usually do parental uh, testing, so test both the parents, and if both parents are uh, have a carrier status, then it sort of uh, confirms the diagnosis. But then we go ahead and do a genetic mutation analysis in the child. Uh, so uh, the transfusion uh, doesn't affect the uh, this test. So at least I would say leave at least ten to fifteen days. after the transfusion that's what lot of centers uh, genetic centers recommend uh, so the genetic evaluation can be done on the child to confirm the diagnosis yeah absolutely so we go ahead and do parents screening or genetic testing however doing the hplc on the child most of the times we find, find that it is inconclusive because you give one month gap and then you will be ready for next transfusion so that is not going to be useful but the first two things are going to be definitely useful and there are various mutations dr virendra patel is he there with us yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry i'm here yeah. i'm already here can you tell us in your uh, practice like what are the common mutations you see and what are the common mutations in india and across the globe yeah th this this looks like more of a, a theoretical question so to answer question to answer your question there yeah, are five mutations have, which are common uh, to see here, in yeah. uh, uh, so uh, this this becomes very relevant because just to understand why the mutations are common in some areas is because this is a, as you know this is a autosomal recessive disease and then it is uh, more prevalent in a population where uh, consanguinity is more so Uh, one particular mutation prevails in one particular region. For that reason, it's important to know your uh, mutations which are common in the region. In India, more common are IVS one five GT, IVS one one GC, followed by codon forty one forty six, followed by for uh, now the six nineteen BP deletions. So uh, there are plenty of uh, type of mutations which are seen, which leads to this kind of disease. It can be uh, you know or, uh, large deletions. two point mutations so there are uh, you name the type of mutation which is seen in a disease you see this kind of mutation uh, in uh, thalassemia like uh, frame shift mutations you know uh, minor deletions major deletions duplications and uh, you know point mutations also leads to this disease 
yeah so absolutely so more, sometimes you know you get uh, two com uh, heterozygous mutations that is compound heterozygous status okay. also and then they phenotypically they behave like a thal major child so that also we do see uh, uh, dr patil can you enumerate uh, for us like what the different transfusion regimens you go ahead and choose for these children what are the what is the practical use so uh... the best the first and foremost thing what should be known for uh, uh, for the doctors who are treating or concerned with thalassemia patients is they must be put on regular blood transfusions so regular is very important in that you know because uh, it should not be uh, left to the patient to come back and whenever they like and, and get the transfusions so they need to be uh, sensitized about maintaining a pre transfusion hemoglobin level which makes the uh, you know uh, uh, things much more simpler if they are going for definitive therapies like bone marrow transplantations or for their uh, well maintenance of uh, you know body growth and development so of, there are many different types of transfusions which are named depending on the type of uh, you know depending on the level of pre transfusion hemoglobin that you are maintaining so if you are going regular transfusion regular is only pertaining to uh, you know you are calling them regularly and then getting the transfusions you are not waiting for the baby to sick or become more paler and symptomatic then you call in the you know, they come for transfusions so uh, a regular transfusion or a normal transfusion is where you keep the pre transfusion hemoglobin of 9 to 10 then there are some other uh, uh, terms which are terminologies like hypertransfusion where the pre transfusion hemoglobin is 10 if the hemoglobin drops to 10 you are you know so, uh, supposed to transfuse them and super transfusion is something which where you keep the pre transfusion hemoglobin around 12 yeah so the, and the other one the last one is like palliative where you leave it to them whenever they they want they come they do they get it get the transfusion that's the uh, worst thing what we see absolutely yeah so we should not let the palliative transfusion happen we have to counsel them to go for regular transfusion because we know that that is the level at which we can ensure the normal growth as well as we can avoid extramedullary hemopoiesis so Uh, Dr. Varshini, can you tell us like when to initiate the transfusion, volume, rate, and what is the goal of transfusion? So, and uh, how do you choose the like next transfusion? So once the diagnosis of the thalassemia has been confirmed, uh, we have to initiate with the uh, hemoglobin less than seven gram per deciliter on two occasions more than two weeks apart. or any other significant uh, uh, symptoms like severe paleo to thrive, poor growth. or significant extra medullary hematopoiesis or uh, uh, excessive intra medullary hematopoiesis causing facial changes or fractures anything you st- go ahead and start your uh, uh, transfusion regular transfusion program coming to the volume uh, volume of transfusion uh, depends upon the hematocrit value of the bag which we are using and the preservative which we use but commonly if we think uh, in a bag of uh, uh, packed red blood cells if a hematocrit of 0.58 we calculate by a formula of 0.3 into desired uh, hemoglobin minus actual hemoglobin into weight but practically what all all of us we do is we uh, do it in a units based because we don't want to uh, more number of egg donor exposures so we do it in a units one unit two units or half a unit and Uh, to uh, avoid uh, um, multiple donor exposures, we do it in a unit basis. Normally, uh, fifteen to twenty, fifteen uh, uh, m, fifteen to twenty mL per kg, uh, we give it uh, to uh, so that the hemoglobin raises by two to three gram per uh, deciliter post transfusion, and we uh, target uh, pre transfusion hemoglobin of nine nine point five to ten point five to maintain a normal growth and normal physical activities. and also it suppresses the bone marrow activity and uh, this is the value where you have a minimal transfusion uh, transfusional iron accumulation within the body also so we target for uh, that uh, hemoglobin and initially we start at a, a lower rate to uh, an extended uh, cro- extended uh, matching of the uh, red blood cells uh, also needs to be done before initiating a transfusion to know about uh, because later on aluminization is one threat uh, with repeated transfusions uh, and the other thing is we initially started a lower rate and then uh, we can give it 5 to 7 ml per kg per hour 
in adults uh, even uh, one unit in an hour also uh, we do transfuse in this because as age grows the number of units uh, uh, we need to transfuse increases so literature says within 90 uh, 60 to 90 minutes also we can give a unit of blood in adults yeah so that's absolutely right so though it says like less than 7 on two occasions at two weeks apart we all know that practically when we see a child with five hemoglobin so we don't wait for the second value we do counsel them and go ahead and advise them to go for transfusion but at times your point is very valid that you know when a child comes to you at 3 4 years we all know that major more than 95% of the uh thalassemia majors they present in infancy are at definitely less than 2 years but at times we see them even at 3 4 years of age small percentage they can present late so that is when parents will be definitely confused whether to initiate the transfusion or not so that is where these kind of guidelines are definitely useful to initiate the transfusions okay so next question so there can be Rick. this uh, what you say is non transfusion dependent or thalassemia intermedia as well it depends so on the type of you so you so in that case i think this point is very valid where you wait for the hemoglobin to yeah. yeah so and of course growth also matters uh, yes, based yes. on the ntdd so we decide is based on the uh, hb value as well as the growth parameters absolutely so ntdd we are not going in detail in the no. best interest of the time So, uh, Dr. Vibha, can you tell us what are the leuco depletion techniques? So, uh, leuco depletion is basically to bring down the. Uh, as we should understand that our patients require only the RBCs; they don't require the WBCs. But then they come in the natural package as blood. So, what we do is we need to remove those WBCs. And the advantages of leuco depletion is that it drastically reduces the non-transfusion, uh, non-hemolytic febrile transfusion reactions. So, that is the most important goal. Secondary is to prevent the transmission of infections. especially uh, cmv infections and that it also decreases allo antibody formation so way to leuco deplete ideally would be a pre storage leuco depletion because uh, that not only decreases the wbc it also decreases all the uh, the enzymes which are released from the wbc so that decreases the transfusion reactions then if that is not available then the bedside filters are available which will decrease the uh, the amount of wbc so ideally is you should you could deplete so whatever is best available to you yeah so the as you said like commonly used one or yes. uh, either uh, pre storage filters or bedside filters but uh, yes. however you can also choose the other techniques like irradiation especially when you are going for stem cell transplantation that is the technique where you can ensure yes. that the leuco depletion is 100% saline so, wash only if you have previous uh, uh, if you have had severe reaction but otherwise that is IgA deficient so yeah. that is when well used and the radiation especially in, uh, if you are preparing for a transplant or even post transplant for one year you may if you have to give blood then you give it radiated absolutely yeah so and uh, so dr parinitha can you tell us like you know what are the adverse reactions specific to repeatedly transfused thalassemia major children we do know like you know there are uh, hemolytic non hemolytic febrile many reactions are there but specific to repeatedly transfused thalassemia major children can you please en- elaborate on that yeah so um, what we don't like is uh, we don't like allo immunization that is one of the major things that we see in repeatedly transfused uh, uh, thalassemia children for in fact any repeatedly transfused child so the idea is to prevent allo immunization because treatment is very difficult so the main thing that we do is um, extended red cell antigen typing Uh, of the child before the first transfusion so that we know we have a baseline and then give the products with extended red cell antigen typing that is the ideal in the ideal world we need to do that at least the cd e and uh, kel so um, this is one of the ways of preventing and uh, the other way is by leuco depleting the uh, red cell uh, product so as we all discussed it's quite important and lot of times i mean the best way to do it is at collection but sometimes it is done at issue and a um, lot of times practically we see in our centers in thalassemia centers we are using bedside uh, uh, filters for leuco depletion so this is uh, the main uh, preventive uh, strategies that we have to use so blood product i mean the rbc is a lifeline for these children 
and we have to make sure ensure that the safe transmission practices are followed to prevent uh, aluminization and also for viral uh, uh, infections yeah absolutely so whenever the child is not incrementing the way you expect them to increment post transfusion and then coming back very quickly with severe pallor definitely you suspect this are antibody formation and then you go ahead and uh, do the appropriate management and preventive aspect is as you said like extended antigen testing and then choosing the blood accordingly is the right way of uh, controlling that or preventing that and uh, other uh, problem that comes with repeated transfusion is and most important problem is iron chelation so we know that transfusion is a necessary evil and that comes with some complications and we need to go ahead and handle those complications and on one of them important one is iron low so what are the various methods how do you monitor iron load and what are the various methods to mon monitor that dr varshni can you elaborate on that so iron overload uh, no serum ferritin is the most common modality we use we repeat once in 3 months and check the uh, iron levels it generally correlates with body iron linearly only up to certain value at a higher values like more than 3500 the linearity is lost but uh, being uh, inexpensive uh, and easy approachable it is a most common modality to monitor the iron overload in the uh, body the uh, but at higher values we need to be very cautious whether the child is having any infections or any uh, inflammatory conditions or hepatitis rather than jumping on the chelation things and uh, we need, uh, the trends of serum ferritin are uh, generally good in a, if a de decreasing trend then uh, it sh uh, shows that there uh, the chelation is appropriate but when uh, there is no change also we need not worry but it, it takes time for the serum ferritin values uh, to show the uh, this one the other thing is a liver iron concentration measurement which is very accurate uh, it is done by different methods biopsy which is but it is an invasive method we need to take a proper core of 2.5 cm and do it uh, we less commonly do that one and uh, t2 star mri which can be done easily but expensive t2 star mri of the liver and heart can be done uh it shows a, a, a good correlation with the total body uh, iron and the other methods like uh, are, are like squid superconducting quantum interference device which is not used now because which is very expensive we need to use liquid helium in it and uh, 24 hours urinary iron uh, estimation can also be done when we are using a deferoxamine or defepron where the iron is excreted mainly through the urine and lastly the uh, labile plasma iron but uh, it doesn't really uh, correlate with the total uh, body iron t2 star mri generally we start doing after 7 years of age and we do it once in uh, once in a year if the values are normal uh, but uh, if any abnormal uh, values uh, any moderate or uh, severe iron overloads then based on that we repeat once in 3 to 6 months and uh, we need to use a three tesla mri only for that purpose and there is an inter observer variability in the uh, values which they give so that needs to be taken care yeah thank you dr varshini so there are the various modalities of monitoring and then when i was talking to one of the ngo organization uh, a young lady asked one of the ngo uh, Uh, coordinator she asked me like why ferritin is done why not serum iron so that's a good question uh, what that has come up from them uh, so we know that like ferritin is the storage form and iron is a labile form so that is the reason why you do ferritin compared to iron so uh, moving on to next question dr vibha can you tell us various iron chelators when do you initiate iron chelator and then how do you choose chelator except adverse effects can you elaborate so, on this uh, so uh, as we know there are now three iron chelators that are available the first and still the gold uh, standard is your desferoxamine and that is a iv preparation iv or a parenteral preparation uh, it cannot be used orally because it has a very sh short uh, time the second one is your deferiprone which came next also known as kelfer so that is a, a tridentate uh, bidentate and it has to be used three times it, it has to be given orally at 75 mg per kg three times a day 
And the most recent one is the Defera Xerox, which is the best of the both worlds. It has to be given orally. It has to be given only once a day. So practically speaking, I think all of us uh, always initiate with Defera Xerox or Desirox, well known as. Uh, you start iron chelation after maybe 10 to 15 transfusions. You do a ferritin. And if that is more than 1,000, and also if the child is more than two years, you initiate uh, chelation. You start with Defera Xerox, start at maybe 20 per kg, keep monitoring your ferritin. You can gradually uh, increase the dose to 30 and even up till 40. So if you have given, at, uh, it takes time to work. So if you've increased the dose, you need to wait. First, the ferritin stabilizes and then it starts coming down. So you have to wait patiently. And all the time you, if the child is more than seven or eight years of age, you also do your uh, monitoring with your, uh, practically we use only cardiac, T2 star, uh, monitoring liver and uh, cardiac. If that is also stable, then you can wait. If that is getting compromised, then you add in a second chelator. So again, practically we add the oral chelators because desferioxamine very good, desferal very good, but practically it is very difficult. It has to be given in a by a pump uh, for at least 12 hours a day for at least six days a week. So it requires a huge uh, uh, compliance from the patient and this thing. So these are the different chelators. The mm -hmm. side effects are not many, but uh, uh, as so far I as think the Sarah, side effects, Dr. Patil yeah, will sorry, elaborate on sorry, that. Sorry, sorry. So Dr. Patil, can you please elaborate on the various side effects you watch for while using these chelators? Dr. Patil? Are you there? Muted. He's muted. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so as we know that there are three types of uh, iron chelators which are available and one is parental and other two are orally administered. Um, so coming to uh, desferoxamine, that is parental uh, iron chelator, uh, it has some specific uh, adverse effects which need to be looked for because it's administered parentally. You will be expecting some local reactions with that. And most important, some and very specific to them is sensory neural hearing loss, uh, ophthalmic changes, and allergic reactions to that, and ab bone abnormalities. These are some important uh, side effects what we see with uh, long-term use of desperoxamine. Coming to oral, orally administered, as we know that they go uh, into gastrointestinal system, so definitely gastrointestinal uh, uh, upsets are expected with these two oral iron chelators. And specific to desferoxerox, uh, are you know it's very common for uh, patients coming back soon after we start these tablets with a rash over the skin, and uh, which are uh, very temporary, and then they fade off after some days. Um, and uh, some specific things that need to be looked for all patients uh, on depressed rocks are iron uh, serum uh, creatinine, which we see that it rises to some extent and then can have proteinuria, elevated hepatic enzymes. And rarely you can see GI bleed or pulmonary hepatic failure with this drug. And the third one is Kelper, that is uh, you know, defer defer prone which has some peculiar uh, adverse effects as it causes uh, agranulocytosis or neutropenia, which uh, should be uh, regularly monitored with CBP. And arthralgia is some, one other uh, side effect which is seen. Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. So as you rightly pointed, like, you know, uh, side effects like arthralgia in, with uh, Kelper and uh, with uh, GA side effects with Defrosirox or common side effects like uh, counts getting affected, all these can be like clearly visible, but things like ophthalmic, ophthalmic changes are silent. So we have to go ahead and monitor them annually for with eye checkup and uh, periodically we go ahead and do the counts as well as the biochemistry. So that will pick up the side effects and we can change the medications accordingly. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so, Dr. Parnita, how do you choose the combination chelators, especially a child coming to you with the very high ferritins at late age? How do you choose and how do you monitor the efficacy of chelations and, uh, in these children? So, um, basically, the efficacy is monitored by ferritin and also the MRI T2 star, as we've discussed. Yeah. And, uh, despite uh, being on a good dose of an oral chelator for a good amount of time, if the child is still having significant iron overload, that is a time to uh, go for 
combination chelators. If you look at it, if suppose if we have a um, uh, severe uh, cardiac iron overload, that is an emergency because it is indicative of imminent uh, cardiac failure. That is when we go for IV uh, desferal. So as a continuous uh, infusion. So that is to bring, bring down the um, uh, cardiac uh, levels rapidly. And we usually use uh, Kelfer in addition, that is Defferin, which in combination is a, is a good agent for uh, uh, cardiac iron uh, overload. So, uh, but sometimes we do see children with severe uh, um, hepatic iron overload, despite being on a single iron uh, chelator, that is when we go for combination. Now, uh, com combining uh, combination chelation hasn't, wasn't approved until 2016, but we know we all used it uh, before that. And even now we use it because, I mean, uh, despite having less evidence, but it, we know it works. Um, nowadays, we have a lot of uh, uh, meta-analysis and reviews saying that it does work very well. So we usually, in case of severe iron overloads, we start with uh, Desperal and with combination with uh, Deferiprone and then monitor them serially with ferritins and also with uh, MRIs. And the next thing uh, is that oral iron chelation. Nowadays, what we're doing is we're going for combination oral chelation, which is uh, combining uh, deficitorosorox and uh, deferiprone, uh, which is working actually quite well. And also what this does is that if you're having a lot of side effects to one of the iron chelators, especially the kelfer, because a lot of arthralgias and agranulocytosis we see with this, um, it actually reduces the toxicity of um, of that when used in combination. So um, we can use a lower dose of, uh, we've seen that a lower dose of kelfer in combination with uh, deficit acidox has uh, helped many children. So it is a very um, experiential thing. I know the guidelines say something, but uh, even now the guidelines are saying that this is quite effective, but uh, um, you know, it, it definitely works. Um, uh, when used in combination, beautifully it works. And we have to give it time. We have to be patient. It doesn't uh, do wonders in days. It takes weeks to months, uh, two years to uh, show its efficacy. Absolutely, yeah. So as you rightly said, like, you know, combination has to be carefully chosen according to the clinical situation. And then we have to uh, initially be aggressive in bringing down the load, when, especially when they are CCF and all. But later, you have to be patient in controlling the um, iron overload and then wait and watch and carefully monitor them. So, and then moving on to the next set of questions, I think uh, CCF part we will skip because we have already addressed that. Uh, Dr. Parnita, can you also tell us like, you know, in the management of special situations like pregnancy, how do you approach them? So usually we say that if, if they're planning to, uh, um, you know, planning for a pregnancy, we ask them to avoid iron chelation. So around that time, preconceptual period, and also in the first trimester. And uh, it all depends. I mean, it has to be carefully done, but a lot of children, people just uh, announce it. So we say um, avoid it in the first trimester. And generally avoidance in pregnancy is a good thing, but a lot of times we can't do that. So in second and third trimester, the safest one is uh, Desperal because uh, Deferiprone and uh, Deferiprone are known to be teratogenic, so they're not recommended. So the oral iron chelators are uh, not indicated in pregnancy because of safety concerns to the fetus. So we usually advise uh, Desperal. Yeah, so absolutely. So one has to go ahead and uh, use Desperal from the second trimester onwards and in the first trimester, you completely avoid and then throughout you have to ensure good transfusion because pregnancy like you know your demands are more like uh, your transfusion has to be more meticulous during that time and then we always have to tell them to go for planned pregnancies rather than sudden announcements because you have to stop the chelation before uh, conceiving and uh, Dr. Varshini can you tell us about the bone health like uh, how do you manage or monitor this bone health because it's one of the big issue in these children so uh, yes uh, bone mineral uh, bone health is very important uh, osteopenias and osteoporosis are more common in, in the thalassemia major kids generally we do annual uh, calcium levels ionized calcium levels phosphorus alkaline phosphate and uh, vitamin d levels 
and also parathormone uh, levels needs to be done because hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is one of the cause for the uh, decreased mineral density, bone mineral density, and urinary calcium and phosphate uh, excretion levels also needs to be done. And after 10 years, we generally measure the bone mineral density by doing a DEXA scan, that is a dual energy X-ray absorption uh, metry. It is a non-invasive technique and uh, we do it over hip, lumbar, uh, spine and distal radius. But one needs to be cautious in doing that because the values of uh, uh, the density depends on the child's uh, body size, skeletal maturation and thalassemia uh, patients generally their uh, uh, bone age is less and then the puberty is delayed. So we need to correlate with the height, bone age and tanner staging of the particular child specifically. And uh, it is done after 10 years, once in uh, one to two years, we need to do it. The other uh, biomarkers are also there for bone turnover, like bone formation, mar forming markers like alkaline phosphatase and bone resorption markers like uh, NKX, Rankel, all this. But generally, they are uh, less available. We uh, don't do it on a regular basis. Other thing is, whenever we are ordering for a DEXA scan, we need to even do the X-ray of the spine, lower spine, for a, uh, to look at the, any spinal fractures or spinal compression. And if at all any doubt, we need to even do an MRI spine also. And coming to the management, prevention is always better than uh, uh, treating them. So we need to uh, uh, advise them good iron chelation with uh, regular uh, blood transfusion to avoid any bone marrow expansions and encourage good physical activity with proper calcium and vitamin D3 supplementations. And if at all any uh, uh, hormonal deficiency, hormonal replacement therapy should be done for gonadal failure and everything. And if we have to treat osteoporosis or osteopenia, bisphosphonates are the drug of choice. We use uh, oral drugs like Alendroid once weekly can be used or daily dosing can be done or an IV form like zolendroic acid can be given. And other novel drugs currently like uh, Rankel inhibitors, denosumab, and uh, recombinant uh, uh, peptide forms of parathormone like strontium are also available, but we use them very less often. Bisphosphonates are more commonly used and uh, we, bisphosphonates shouldn't be used more than two to three years. And we need to be very cautious uh, when in an adult, I mean like when the female patients, when they want to go ahead with the pregnancy, then it, these needs to be stopped at least for six months to one year of period. And the complications which you need to look at is the jaw necrosis, vascular necrosis of the uh, jaw bone is one thing which we need to see. And uh, some side effects of, of like postural hypotension uh, and nephrotoxicity, all these things also needs to be monitored. That's absolutely right. As you rightly said, uh, uh, monitoring for these uh, complications in early period and then preventing them adds on to the good health and ensure good physical exercise. That is like in addition to your medications, that is one of the things which will ensure the bone health in these children. Dr. Weber, can you enum uh, enumerate endocrine complications in these children? Because that is another silent problem that can cause morbidity in these children. So a uh, huge number of endocrine complications have been described in these children. In fact, they are responsible for keeping our endocrine clinics busy. You know, the, our pediatric endocrinologists are half busy because of our kids. So that is due to multiple factors, basically iron deposition and sometimes poor uh, blood transfusion regimens. So uh, as the chart is showing about 50 to 40 to 50 percent will land up with hypogonadism hypo, uh, uh, a short stature, uh, diabetes mellitus, hypoparathyroidism responsible for the poor bone health and hypothyroidism. So we need to monitor uh, after, especially after 10 years of age with relevant tests for the same, we need to monitor their growth and development. So when the children, these children are coming for regular transfusions, you need to do their weight and height, put, the, put it on the charts, and if you find that they are faltering in growth, we need to refer them immediately to our endocrine colleagues. And uh, we also need to do their uh, testing for their HbA1c or sugars. So HbA1c may be a little complicated test in these children, but yes, we can do a, a glucose tolerance test for uh, detecting diabetes mellitus. 
then hypoparathyroidism and hypothyroidism can be done by uh, regularly doing their thyroid status, parathyroidism by the parathyroid hormone, and uh, just as Dr. Varshini has said, all the bone parameters. So hypogonadism can be detected by clinical manifestations. You check their uh, SMR uh, things very regularly. For uh, girls, you can start as early as eight years of age. For boys, at least at 12 years or age. And if they are lagging in their puberty for girls beyond 12 and for boys beyond 14, then you need to refer them. I would do it much earlier than that. Yeah. So clinical examination and monitoring for these complications once they reach 10 to 12 years and aggressively controlling them will ensure the good health in uh, overall good health. So, I would like to just point out one thing here. Endocrine system, what we found in our clinics is that it's very, very sensitive to uh, the iron, iron, deposition. Yeah. So iron deposition. So like even the seemingly reasonably well-controlled thalassemic children can land up in uh, uh, endocrine issues. So that's what uh, we've observed and parents are really surprised at that point. So this is something which we t have to counsel them at the outset. And it is also the commonest cause of poor quality of life. I think these yes. children, when they, they are growing up as adults in their adolescent stage, I think that is the thing that gives them a very poor self-image. So, and as uh, clinicians, we are more worried about many other things. So that is a yeah. mismatch in the, the treating team and the patients. So absolutely, yeah. So as rightly pointed out, we just have we need to be aware that it is very sensitive to iron overload, and then monitoring for these complications at right age is very important to uh, avoid these problems. Uh, Dr. Eva, can you tell us what is the uh, role of splenectomy in these children? So uh, I wish uh, Sirisha, I didn't have to answer that question. So I will start by saying that there is no role. So Absolutely. most yeah. important thing is that you manage, you give blood transfusions properly. A well-managed, well-transfused thalassemic child will have no or very, very soft, mild splenomegaly. So having said that, if your uh, child has a huge splenomegaly, that will lead to hypersplenism, which will be detected by increase in the requirement of blood transfusions. And that is if you monitor it. So even on six monthly, you can calculate the amount of blood required per kg per year. And if it goes beyond 200 to 20, then that is an indication. The late hypersplenism sign will be, you know, a neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. So this is when you will have to go for a splenectomy. And then you have to do all the cautions, give them their vaccines, do the, um, uh, start them on penicillin prophylaxis uh, after doing all that. Then also, it's always a situation you know, where there is increased threat to life, especially by thrombotic complications and uh, complications, late complications of pulmonary hypertension. So these are absolutely unavoidable. Having said that, that is why we would like to avoid a splenectomy as far as possible. Yeah, as you very, very rightly said, uh, we should uh, say that there is no role of splenectomy as long as we manage them appropriately by giving regular transfusions. So that they don't go into extramedullary hemopoiesis and then develop the bad spleen. But however, we end up seeing some of the big spleens in majority of our children. And then we have to go ahead and choose like splenectomy as one of the mode of management. And then you do have guidelines yeah. of more than two. And then also wait till at least eight, eight nine years, years of age. At yeah. least wait till eight, nine years. Sure. Uh, Dr. Patil, can you please tell us about the uh, role of stem cell transplantation because we know that you know that is one of the uh, huge successful treatment like in uh, thalassemia major one of the treatment modality that has huge success can you tell us about the stem cell transplantation in thalassemia major uh, just in the interest of time because uh, uh, mstoperative stem cell transplantation in thalassemia itself would be uh, you know one hour session uh, so the, uh, definitely uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation has got a definitive role in thalassemia and presently this is the only method or only mode of treatment which can give a cure to these children. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, the success of transplantation depends how best the child has been managed before the child lands up in a you know, transplantation center. So it is very, very important that the children are well prepared by doing regular transmissions and regular, uh, you know, iron chelation.
can you i can't hear dr patil you can't either okay so i think there is some technical problem so as he uh, said with his opening statement that you know it has a definite role and it is the only curative option in india right now gene therapy is uh, there as modality of one of the permanent solution but that is mainly limited to western countries i think it just started in cmc weller if i am not wrong dr siddharth is online then he can add on to that uh, but in india it is not done elsewhere and uh, it's predominantly in adults but few children also like uh, had gene therapy but it is as of now the mainstay of treatment for permanent solution is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and that has huge success rate especially when you when you are transplanting with sibling or match related donor with as per ebmt data of 2016 more than 98% 90 5 to 98% success rate which is excellent uh, dr parnita can you uh, elaborate on your medications yeah apart from these high cost uh, um, things the newer medications you, the one thing that has been on the horizon was is the hydroxyurea we know we use it in sickle cell and also in uh, thal intermediates in thalassemia major also evidence is upcoming that it is quite effective in reducing the uh, number of transfusions that um, a, a patient is uh, needing and it doesn't have many uh, side effects and it is quite cheap in expensive way so we are we have begun to use uh, hydroxyurea and uh, also uh, lusipatacept is another agent that is approved for adults and it's quite effective in uh, uh, reducing the number of transfusions in uh, thalassemia transfusion dependent thalassemias so these are the two uh, promising agents that i can uh, talk about there are lot of them in the horizon but you know with, without much evidence absolutely so those uh, are the two uh, Sirisha, agents uh, here which i are would more promising. just like to uh, just make a comment that while we were on the transplant like i think as pediatricians and hematologists we have a huge responsibilities for keeping our children you know well uh, this thing for transplant we know about the pisaros uh, 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 classification uh, classification so our duty is to you know keep them well transfused give a good chelation so they don't have hepatomegaly and iron overload give them a good chelation so they are the best uh, uh, candidates for transplant so i just absolutely to... yeah so and most important thing we have come to that is prevent prevention of thalassemia so we it has been already highlighted uh, by dr parnita and dr patil and other uh, speakers that you know the carrier status is quite high in our community so we will move on to the various screening techniques in community if dr patil is there online can you tell us what are the various uh, screening techniques okay so dr viba can you add on to that and at the same time can you please address like what are the challenges in counseling extended families you have to unmute unmute sorry so uh, the screening technique is the best thing is a hemogram done on a automated cell counter so if you have a mild anemia with a low uh, with a low mcv and a normal or a high rbc count so that would be a uh, immediate uh, pointer that maybe this is this is a patient who may be a thal trait uh, in a situation in the antenate in the in the uh, natal setting i mean in the pregnant women there is not much time so you can immediately also ask for a hba2 so high hba2 done uh, on an hplc would be a, a pointer towards a carrier status having detected that then you ask for a, a hba2 of the uh, of the women's husband and then if he is also a carrier then you would do a genetic counseling and advise them to go for a antenatal diagnosis so in the community the people to target would be the first thing would be to do a uh, uh, uh for all the pregnant women that would be the first target population and then going ahead would be for the extended families then next would be young uh, couples eligible for marriage so in the colleges and all that still further would be at a community level where you know the communities who are at high risk for uh, who have a very high carrier status more than three up to the tune of 17% and then next would be a mass awareness for all the uh, general public so that would be using all sorts of media and uh, other things 
so uh, challenges in counseling extended families would be the main uh, challenge that i have countered is you know uh, 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 it's it's a status that they are positive so if if you tell a marriageable girl that you do your career status and then she turns out to be a trait then the families feel that it is like a, a stigma so they they don't it's very difficult to make them understand that there is nothing like a stigma it's just that we need to be aware of this so that is a, a challenge that we have encountered i think that is the worst challenge that we have encountered absolutely yeah so in our society we do face that still and then we have to go ahead and address that and uh, in va- various uh, age groups where you can pick up the hba2 is like you know your school colleges and pregnant women and then uh, of course screening the extended families and all it is very important because we know that you know it is a preventable disease we all have to put the active effort in uh, screening at various uh, uh, levels of uh, community and uh, in certain states i think where the uh, career status is very high they do go ahead and do um, it as a mandatory test whenever they take the admissions in colleges and schools so that is what uh, if we can adopt that same elsewhere also like you know definitely we can prevent this uh, dr parnita can you go ahead and tell us various techniques of antenatal testing when to do and how do you counsel them when uh, the gestation and all yeah so antenatal testing has to begin when the child is diagnosed and in the first few counselings itself in a known mm-hmm. family of thalassemia major that we have to the best way of preventing uh, the next baby from having a thalassemia is by antenatal testing and despite this many uh, people present late to us so what we usually say is as soon as you know you are pregnant please come to us and then we guide them so one of the ways to do in early pregnancy is by chorion villus sampling and uh, later pregnancy that is before 20 weeks is amniocentesis now before even doing all this we need to know the genetic mutation of the previous child or the genetic uh, uh, presumed mutation if it is a first child and both parents are carriers then we need to know the genetic mutation in both the parents so that is a mandatory and uh, why we do genetic mutation analysis in children who are newly diagnosed diagnosed with thalassemia a is to confirm the diagnosis and two is to prevent a, an, another child in the family from having thalassemia so if we, it takes about 2 uh, to 3 4 weeks to for this result to uh, uh, be obtained that's why we want it to be ready before the next pregnancy in case of uh, child, uh, families who haven't completed their families and uh, once we have that then we can do uh, we can uh, test the fetus either by cvs or by amniocentesis and this again takes time for the report to come so this is again very time timelines are very sen- sensitive so all this has to be counseled much beforehand and even when the uh, uh, lady presents to us so um, usually about 3 4 weeks is the turnaround time is what we see so that once we find out that the child has a thalassemia major they i mean likely to have thalassemia major then we have time to uh, counsel this family and offer a termination offering is the only thing that we can do we cannot advise that you go for it and uh, some sometimes we do find a carrier status in the fetus then that is not reported so that is a safe way of preventing uh, you know unnecessary uh, terminations yeah so absolutely so we were, that is the uh, another stage where you can go ahead and counsel them appropriately and encourage them to go for anti that diagnosis and as dr panita rightly said the antenatal diagnosis counseling should start from the first counseling itself so that you don't want second child to be born in the same family with the thalassemia major as well as screening the extended family members especially in the age group where they are uh, you know reproductive age group like you know definitely we have to go ahead and encourage them to go ahead and test for the high hba2 so uh, we speak quite a lot about management aspect transplants even newer agents gene therapy calculations everything but we all know that it is a stoppable thing and it is a preventable disease so we need to concentrate more on preventive aspect in thalassemia major so that we can also achieve uh, the results similar to greece where they have a zero thalassemia uh, newborn babies like uh, be a new uh, cases 
of thalassemia is zero. So we also should be able to achieve that in the future with the aggressive screening in the community as well as you know aggressive counseling for the antenatal diagnosis and extended family screening. So with that, we should be able to achieve that in the future. Thank you all. And I thank all the panelists for their uh, precious time and then valuable inputs uh, for the session. And uh, I apologize uh, um, IAPTCB for overshooting the time, but we all had a good, uh, interesting talks in the beginning and then good panel discussion. Um, the, over to organizers, thank you. Thank you, Sirisha and your you. team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir, unmute yourself, sir. Sinkoj, sir, unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sirisha. It was an excellent and elaborate discussion on thank you, sir. anemias and uh, thalassemias. And I, my special thanks to all the panelists. Uh, really, they are with us since morning, 9 o'clock, so more than three hours, with the same freshness in their face, with the same glow and happiness. Again, it tells us that they forget the time during academic activities. So my sincere thanks on behalf of IAP TCB for enlightening us, for improve our, improving our knowledge and uh, maybe skills about your pediatric hematology. I'm sure my co-participants are enlightened more about uh, these issues. Once again, on behalf of entire IAP Twin Cities branch, 900 members, we sincerely thank you all for uh, honoring our uh, request. It's a privilege and honor to us as well. So wishing all a very Happy Sunday and hope you all enjoy today evening FIFA World Cup final match. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.